so it's uh, seven o'clock. Welcome everybody. Um, Commissioner Maxwell's not here yet. Has anybody heard from him? Is he on his way? He sent an email that he was uh, not feeling well. Oh, okay, so he'll be out tonight and missed. All right, well then I, uh, it would be my honor to call this meeting of the Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Before we get going, it's fun to be in person and I anticipate uh, technical difficulties and all sorts of dumb questions, at least from me. So let's all just settle in. You know, it feels weird to be here in 3D. So I wanted to acknowledge that um, as we move into our business tonight. Um, Tess, would you start us off with a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Dawson? Here. Gordon? Here. Maxwell? Nasidi Miller? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. Chair Kennedy? Here. Thank you. So, commissioners, are there any statements of disqualification for the agenda items tonight? I don't hear any, so we'll move on to oral communications. Uh, welcome, public. Thank you for coming out, particularly in person. I know it's more work than a Zoom. Um, now is the time to come address the commission on any item that's not on tonight's agenda. So if you have uh, things about these projects, there's time for that later. But anything not on the agenda, come on up. Uh, we'll put a timeline of two minutes on these comments to keep things moving. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I had a couple pictures to share. Could you give me some latitude to just get the, those up? Sure, take your time. Okay. And make yourself comfortable. Thank you, uh, thank you, Commission. My name is Eric Rodberg. That's my house at 115 May Avenue. It's a 100 block of May Avenue. It's a dead end. And there's um, a project, uh, 515 Soquel, which is in the pipeline. It's a large residential project that will, um, it's a flag lot that will come out onto May. And because um, the size of the project, the neighbors are concerned about parking my house doesn't have a curb cut. Uh, you can see a kind of sort of pseudo curb cut on one side. And um, so this is a very large house. It's a six bedroom house. It's legitimately six bedrooms. As you can see, it's, it's nice and well maintained. It's part of the uh, residential rental inspection program. And the, uh, so it's gonna be a huge problem because the city's parking program only allows for three residential permits and two guest permits. At times they'll um, allow you to get five residential permits and no guest permits, but this is there's this has been a rental since at least the mid 80s. I've owned it since 1994. Parking's never been an issue. And um, I've talked to the parking office and they say they're, the neighbors are okay with giving my house an exception to issue more residential permits, but the parking office says that there is no um, mechanism for that. I'm totally in favor of more housing and I support the 515 Soquel project and I understand there'll be impacts but this is this is unacceptable particularly because in this proposed permit parking program they're saying no parking whatsoever from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. So like I live on the west side on Trescany Street and we've had permit parking for decades and it's two hours at night there's no restrictions, weekends, no restrictions. So the residents who live on the street legitimately in a nice house are not gonna be able to park unless you guys can get together with planning and transportation and do something <laughs> for me. The next door neighbor is a duplex that's in the same situation, although it's a derelict house, um, but they also don't have a curb cut or any or any driveway. So okay. I, if there's a mechanism that you guys can point me to, I know you don't normally respond to oral communications, but I've been trying to go through the normal bureaucracy and, you know. As chair, I'm allowed to respond. Uh, thank you for your okay, comments. Thank Thanks you. for being here. Um, Eric or Tess, could you make sure this gentleman has the staff contact for that project? And sir, I just encourage you to work with staff and the developer directly as much as possible. Well, the de developer has nothing to do with it, really. The developer, this is an issue, it's a city parking program yeah, for yeah, the street. No, no, we have permit parking on my street, I know exactly where you're coming from, there's yeah. limits on it. But I, I would encourage you to reach out to the right staff person and 
They're, they're the person who can help you. You can CC me if you want to. Okay, thank you. I did I did send the whole commission an email. Understood. There's a process going on, but that's a good way to plug into it. All right, any other oral communications? Hearing none, we'll move on. Uh, the next item is the consent agenda. We have a minor adjustment. The number two and three we're going to see next meeting, just the minutes weren't done. So does anyone want to pull that first item off the consent agenda or Cindy? I, I was just wondering if I could move the whole consent agenda to a time certain, the March 16th meeting. Certainly. I'd like I'd like to do that. So both that and, and the uh, parking, the bicycle changes. That's the motion on the floor. Fine with me. Is there any particular urgency with that bicycle thing? Uh, staff asked to continue it. Oh, there we go. Second. Second. Right there. All right. Can we have a roll call vote on that? Commissioner Conway. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Gordon. Aye. Uh, Masidi Miller. Aye. Paul Hemis. Aye. Aye. All right, so the next uh, item in our agenda is the rail trail, item four. I'll now open the public hearing for that item, and if we could have the uh, presentation, that'd be great. Thank you, Tim. Nice to see you in person. Good evening, uh, Chair Kennedy and members of the Planning Commission. My name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. This evening's first agenda item is review of the Coastal Rail Trail Segments 8 and 9 project. The Coastal Rail Trail Segments 8 and 9 project is one component of a years-long interjurisdictional collaborative effort. The City of Santa Cruz is the lead agency for the project. Uh, Mr. Nathan Nguyen, to my right, Director of Public Works, is the City's lead for the project. As mentioned, my name is Tim Mayer, representative of the City's Planning and Community Development Department. Um, partnering agencies include the County of Santa Cruz, represented by uh, Rob Tidmore, uh, Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, represented by Grace Blakesley. Uh, the city's design consultant is RM Design Group, led by Mike Sherrod, and the environmental um, consultant is Harrison Associates, represented by Kate Elliott. Yeah. Sure. Uh, and, and can you hear so me while, I, while we're interrupted, can people just raise their hands so I can get faces with these names? Is that all some, right? some of the folks aren't here, unfortunately. Oh, okay. if people are. Yeah, is that is that better? Can you hear me now? Are the mics okay. working, folks? They are now. Okay. Okay. Apologies. Like I said, there's going to be some glitches here, so bear with us. <laughs> okay, so uh, I, th I was just introducing the folks involved with the project, and um, I can hear the audio now. Um, so the uh, I was mentioning um, the last person uh, was uh, Kate Elliott with um, Harrison Associates, who's the environmental consultant for the project. And Sabrina Teller is uh, representative of Rem Remy Moose and Manley, the city's outside legal counsel. Brief background for the project. So the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail, or MBSST, is a multi-use bicycle and pedestrian network first envisioned about 20 years ago and developed collaboratively through years of public engagement and outreach. Once complete, the MBSST will comprise a 50-mile long trail extending from southern San Mateo County in the north northern Monterey County in the south, generally paralleling, paralleling State Highway 1 and the Pacific Coast. The portion of the uh, trail, MBSST, within Santa Cruz County is a 32-mile long coastal rail trail, which will form the spine or primary alignment of, of the overall Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network. Just can I check that my audio is vi on, okay, audible? Um, as a continuous and separated bicycle pedestrian path spanning the length of the Santa Cruz County coast. A development of the MBSST network and Coastal Rail Trail are both guided by the Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Network Master Plan. An environmental impact report for the master plan was completed in 2013. The trail network master plan divides the Coastal Rail Trail alignment into 20 segments with logical beginning and end points, and each segment has been or will be con uh, constructed upon availability of funding. Segments seven and eight and a portion of segment nine fall within the limits of the city of Santa Cruz. The Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, or RTC, is a government agency responsible for overseeing interjurisdictional transportation in Santa Cruz County and the agency which administers the rail trail corridor. In 2012, the RTC purchased from Union Pacific Railroad the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, or SBRL, 
which is a federally regulated freight railroad line which runs through the rail trail corridor. Although the RTC owns the railroad right away, a private rail operator owns a freight easement over the rail tracks and therefore the rail uh, line remains designated as an active railway. In this slide, uh, the image to the right-hand side um, illustrates the path of the coastal rail trail in blue, uh, kind of a pale blue color you can see over here. And the span of the segments eight and nine project are depicted here in bright green, kind of in the middle. As part of the overall rail trail, the proposed coastal rail trail segments eight and nine project is presented for consideration this evening for entitlement by the Planning Commission. The project requires approval of several permits, including a design permit, a slope modification permit, or slope variance, and a water course variance. A design permit is required for a review of site development proposals and allows for review of project design and aesthetics. A slope modification permit is required for consideration of location of structures greater than 10 feet uh, away from a 30% plus slope. And a slope variance is required for review of project components within 10 feet of a 30% or greater slope. A water course variance must be reviewed for work necessary with, within riparian corridors of city waterways and for review of variation from water course setbacks or development standards in the citywide creeks and wetlands management plan. Not listed here, a coastal per development permit is additionally required for proposed modifications within the coastal zone, including proposed removal of existing trees. The coastal permit must be submitted directly to the California Coastal Commission because the rail trail corridor overlaps land across the harbor, which is within the original permit ju jurisdiction of the Co California Coastal Commission. For purposes of efficiency and clarity, the city will pursue, along with the county, a single consolidated coastal development permit submitted to the California Coastal Commission. As mentioned, trees proposed for removal fall within the coastal zone and are therefore reviewed as part of the coastal development permit. Therefore, the commission is not requested, the planning commission is not requested to take action directly on proposed tree removals this evening. <coughs> However, the environmental impacts associated with proposed tree removal is analyzed in the environmental impact report prepared for this project, and a number of mitigation measures um, are incorporated as project conditions of approval, which would reduce to the extent possible the impacts of proposed tree removal. As a project under the California Environmental Quality Act, with the potential to result in significant environmental impacts, the project additionally requires certification of an environmental impact report, along with adoption of a mitigation monitoring and reporting program and statement of overriding considerations. This slide shows the path of rail trail segments eight and nine. Segment eight, shown here in orange, originates at the Pacific Avenue Beach Street roundabout over here on the left-hand side of the slide, also known as the wharf roundabout. Um, it extends about 0 0.6 mile along Beach Street, terminating at the San Lorenzo River Trestle Bridge. Segment nine, shown in kind of a teal color, kind of pale green, spans a distance of 1.6 miles, continuing from the Murray Street Bridge and terminating at the easterly side of 17th Avenue. The portion of segment eight that continues along the San Lorenzo River Trestle Bridge was completed um, in 2019. All of segment eight and a portion of segment nine are situated within the limits of the city of Santa Cruz. And the extent of segment nine east of the Harbor Bridge occurs entirely outside of city limits and within the jurisdiction of the county of Santa Cruz, which the, the city has no regulatory authority. Improvements to segment eight include enhancement to or replacement of existing infrastructure, including both the dedicated cycle track and pedestrian uh, path. In segment nine, the existing Santa Cruz branch rail line consists of railroad tracks and ties and associated rail infrastructure. As proposed, the project would include construction of a new multi-use bicycle and pedestrian trail, which would run parallel to the existing rail line in segment nine. <clears throat> Two possible strategies or approaches have been considered, um, including the ultimate trail configuration, excuse me, um, the approach recommended by staff, which would include in segment eight, improvement of the existing bikeway and sidewalk, and then again in segment nine, construction of a new 12-foot wide multi-use trail placed on the inland side of the existing railroad tracks, which would switch to the coastal side of the tracks near El Dorado Avenue at Simpkins Swim Center in the county's jurisdiction and continue along the coastal side for the remaining uh, remainder of its easterly extent. An optional phased approach has been conceptualized for development of segment nine and evaluated in an equal level of detail 
for environmental analysis as the ultimate trail configuration. In the first part, or uh, first phase, excuse me, part one, all or a portion of the trail in segment nine would be constructed in approximately the same location as the railroad tracks through removal of rails and ties. In the second phase, or part two, the interim trail would be removed and the rail reconstructed. And in the third phase, the ultimate trail configuration would finally be constructed with a new trail positioned parallel to the rail line as, the ultimate, as in the ultimate trail configuration, which is the preferred and recommended approach. Uh, this slide shows an illustration of the proposed nature of improvement as included in segment eight. The existing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure would be replaced and enhanced with new green bicycle lanes included, for example, and minor improvements incorporated, such as the pedestrian uh, shelter or photo opportunity island in the foreground as shown over here. Um, as displayed in this slide, um, associated modifications for enhanced safety and ease of circulation, such as horizontal striping, shown in the middle here, uh, would provide a visual cue to areas in which pedestrians would potentially cross the cycle path. Improvements in segment eight will be the same for both the ultimate trail configuration or the trail next to rail approach as recommended by staff and the optional interim trail or the three-part phased approach. This slide shows a section of the preferred and recommended approach uh, called again the trail next to rail line or the ultimate trail configuration. As shown here, segment nine of the ultimate trail configuration would include construction of a new 12-foot wide multi-use trail, as shown on the right, a position adjacent to the existing rail line, which would be retained. And an eight-inch tall curb would be placed between the existing rail, shown over here in the middle, and the new track at a distance of eight and a half to 10 feet, depending on the curvature of the track, from the center line of the existing trail. To ensure the safety of trail users, wildlife Friendly fencing would also be installed, as shown on the right-hand slide. Side uh, guardrails would have no gaps exceeding four inches for fall protection, where necessary. This slide shows a cross-section of the optional first phase of the three-part phased approach considered for the project, called the optional interim trail. As mentioned, the first part of the phased approach would include rem removal of the existing rail line, which is considered an historic resource for the purpose of project review due to its due to its potential for listing as an historic resource in various listings. In the first part, implementation of the interim trail, the existing tracks and ties would be removed, and a 16-foot wide multi-use interim trail, as shown here, um, would be installed in the center line of the existing railroad tracks, which is illustrated again in this slide. In part two, which is not shown in this slide, but which would follow part one, the trail would be removed and the rail line would be rebuilt in its former location. And in part three of the, uh, of the optional interim trail approach, a 12-foot wide trail would be constructed parallel to the rebuilt trail line. The optional interim trail approach would involve three separate periods of construction with an own unknown period of time between each part or phase. This approach would also require more extensive tree removal as an eight-foot wide trail and a six-inch curb would be built on both sides of the, uh, the uh, rail center line. The project would involve construction of a various infrastructure, including retaining walls, waterway crossings, improvements to the existing roadway, installation of fencing, guardrails, and lighting, placement of trash receptacles, bicycle parking and benches, and new signage. Um, this slide illustrates the proposed rail, or excuse me, waterway crossings, which are proposed to be achieved through a variety of infrastructure. For instance, retaining walls would be placed as an undercrossing at the East Cliff, Cliff Bridge, as shown over here, my cursor is. Um, as a clear span prefabricated bridge at Pilkington Creek, and as a bridge at Woods Lagoon and a viaduct at East Harbor, and as viaducts over Leona Creek and Live Oak in the county's jurisdiction. At the Pilkington Creek crossing, design considerations for the ultimate trail configuration, again, the approach preferred and recommended by city staff, would be constructed including a clear span pre <coughs> excuse me, prefabricated bridge featuring deck likely of steel framing with an abutment on either side supported by drilled concrete pilings. The slide here shows a rendering of the proposed improvement. This slide depicts a visual rendering of the same stretch of trail which would be constructed as part one of the optional interim trail approach. As shown, the existing rail would be removed and the trail built in its place. This slide again illustrates the ultimate trail configuration option, which is the preferred and recommended approach. 
and the lo location in which the trail would switch from the inland side to the coastal side, traversing the train tracks near El Dorado Avenue to provide access to Swimkins, the Simpkins Swim Center within the county's jurisdiction. This slide portrays the same extent of trail if constructed as the optional interim trail, the first part of the three-part uh, three phased approach. At Woods Lagoon, or the Harbor Bridge, uh, two potential connections from the proposed rail trail to the harbor are shown as seen in this slide. Uh, please note in this slide that north is actually the bottom of the slide and south is at the top. A connection from the rail trail to the westerly side of the harbor is shown on the right-hand side of the slide an informal path is proposed. Uh, the rail trail has been proposed also to connect to the existing harbor at the East Harbor connection, at uh, the easterly side, again on the left-hand side of the slide here, uh, envisioned as a series of switchbacks as shown in yellow. The rail trail would traverse Woods Lagoon, Santa Cruz Harbor as a viaduct at its westerly side um, within a cross section, with a cross section shown in the lower right-hand side of the next slide which would connect to a box girder bridge with composite decking at its east side. So I, I just referenced the cross sections of the bridge and the viaduct. Um, the proposed harbor bridge would include a composite deck system, as shown here in this slide. It would be cantilevered from the side of the existing precast concrete railroad bridge, similar to the portion of segment eight of the San Lorenzo River trestle bridge. Uh, a section of the proposed viaduct is additionally provided, as shown over here on the right-hand side of the slide, um, the environmental impacts of the East Harbor Connection were, an were analyzed as part of the project. However, the East Harbor Connection has been excluded from consideration for approval at this time in response to concerns and comments provided by the Santa Cruz Board District as included in the final EIR. Extensive public outreach has been conducted as required by the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, um, and as per the city's public outreach policy. Uh, dates of notable community engagement Public outreach events are shown here. The city determined early that an environmental impact report or EIR would be required to, uh, to disclose, analyze, and mitigate the range of potentially significant environmental impacts associated with the proposed project. Uh, an EIR provides a robust analysis and a public review process, for consideration of alternatives, and mitigation for consideration of potential for significant impacts while providing for maximum legal defensibility. Um, at this point, I'd like to uh, hand the presentation over to Kate Elliott, um, the lead consultant with Harrison Associates, who prepared the environmental impact report for the project. Hi. Welcome. Can you guys hear me OK on this, this mic? OK, great. Uh, as Tim stated, I'm Kate Elliott with um, Harrison Associates, and I led the Harris team in preparation of the EIR. The Harris team also includes Ecosystems West for biological resources, and with us tonight are Aaron McGlinsey and Justin Davila, biologists. Uh, the team also included uh, Rincon Consulting for the cultural resources analysis and other topics, and with us tonight are Megan Jones and Steve Trevers and Shelby Ramsden. Thank you. <laughs> You're going to drive for me, right? Sure. Okay, great. Um, just as a reminder, uh, the purpose of CEQA and the EIR process is to identify the environmental impacts uh, so that the lead agency can make an informed decision on the, on the project, and it's to provide the public and agencies the opportunity to weigh in on the project. Next. Uh, the state CEQA guidelines identify these 20 environmental topics for evaluation. Using these guidelines and the associated questions for these topics, the draft EIR identified 52 potential impacts. Most of these impacts would be less than significant as shown for the topics in green or reduced to a less than significant level with mitigation measures as shown for the topics in gold. The impacts of the project that can't be reduced to a less than significant level with mitigation are aesthetics and biological resources. Next slide, please. The proposed project with or without the optional interim trail would result in significant unavoidable impacts to aesthetics and biological resources from substantial tree removal along segment nine between the San Lorenzo Trestle Bridge and 17th Avenue. For aesthetics, spaces from tree removal could improve distant views of the ocean and the mountains, but it could degrade local views of scenic resources, including dense trees and vegetation along the corridor. For biological resources, the tree removal could adversely affect monarch butterfly roost habitat 
by removing trees that serve as a wind buffer to roost sites. The trail was modified, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this part or not, but the trail had been modified to the extent feasible to minimize tree removal at these locations. For example, on both the east and west sides of the harbor, the trail was redesigned as a viaduct with the pilings at different intervals. And um, that supported, supports the trail and replaced an earlier at-grade design that would have required retaining walls and that would have resulted in a lot more tree removal. The tree removal could also interfere with local wildlife movement by reducing cover and foraging opportunities um, for animals that use the corridor to move between different open spaces such as Arana Gulch and Twin Lake State Beach. The removed trees would be replaced at ratios and locations determined in coordination with the regulatory agencies. However, the impact for aesthetics and biological resources was still determined to be significant and unavoidable because the exact location of the replacement trees is uncertain at this time and the timing of growth to maturity cannot be predicted with certainty. For cultural resources, the optional interim trail would result in an additional significant and unavoidable impact because it would remove the rail line that is eligible for listing in the state and national historical registries. NEPA <laughs> requires the lead agency to identify and consider project alternatives. Chapter five of the draft EIR identifies several alternatives considered, including those that were suggested as part of the scoping process. It explains why some were dismissed from further consideration and these three that were carried <laughs> forward and analyzed analyzed at a lesser level of detail than the project as allowed by CEQA. The trail only alternative was suggested during the EIR scoping process, and it includes removal of the tracks and ties and construction of a permanent 26 foot wide trail on the rail bed. The um, alternative two, the interim trail with rail preservation was selected for evaluation because it would reduce the significant and unavoidable impact on historic resources. Instead of removing the rail, a 16-foot wide trail on decking would be, re, would be placed over the tracks and ties. And like the optional interim trail, it would include later removing the interim trail and constructing the ultimate trail configuration. The no project alternative is required by CEQA, and it assumes the rail corridor would remain as is with no trail development. The draft EIR provides a comparative summary of the impacts of the proposed project and the alternatives. As expected, the no project would have the least environmental impact. Overall, the impacts of the proposed project with or without the optional interim trail and alternatives one and two would be very similar. CEQA requires that an environmentally superior alternative be identified that is not the no project alternative. So we need to drill down a little bit on that. Next slide. This slide compares the alternatives to the proposed project of the ultimate trail configuration. For biological resources, there would be more tree removal and alternative one trail only would extend further south of the rail line, resulting in more impacts to sensitive habitats on the coastal side, including Twin Lake State Beach, Monarch Roost Habitat near the San Lorenzo River, and bird rookeries near the Santa Cruz Harbor. For cultural resources, there would be more impact to historical resources from removal of the rail line under the optional interim trail and alternative one. For construction related impacts, there would be more earth movement and construction related emissions, noise and sediment from the two additional construction periods that are required for an interim trail. This slide uh, compares tree removal, which was quantified for the proposed project and estimated for alternatives one and two. The proposed project without the interim trail would remove 381 trees, including 117 in the city limits. The proposed project with the interim trail would remove 404 trees, that is 124 for construction of the interim trail, and then later another 280 for construction of the ultimate trail. Alternative one trail only would remove a similar number of trees with less tree removal on the inland side and substantially, substantially more on the coastal side. Alternative two interim trail with rail preservation would remove a similar number of trees as the optional interim trail. 
So in summary, the proposed project ultimate trail configuration was identified as the environmentally superior alternative because full implementation of an interim trail requires three construction periods instead of one and more tree removal overall. A substantially wider trail only results in greater impacts to sensitive habitats, particularly on the coastal side of the rail. And there would be no significant unavoidable impact to historical resources from rail removal. So the draft EIR was circulated for a 53-day public review period, which was extended from the 45-day minimum. There was a public meeting held on October 19th to share the EIR findings and to take comments. Um, a number of commenters provided feedback, including four agencies, six organizations, and 82 members of the public. The 82 comment letters or commenters included 292 individual comments. There was a wide variety of comments, as you can imagine, from supporting or opposing the project to commenting on the issues addressed and the impacts disclosed. Responses were provided for each of the individual comments. Many comments are similar or concern the same issue, including those listed on this slide. So uh, for these comments, we developed master responses and provided those at the very beginning of the comments and responses document. So the final EIR includes three volumes. Volume one is all the comments and the responses to those comments. Volume two is the draft EIR with some minor revisions that were made for clarification since it was distributed for public review. And volume three is the EIR appendices. And that's it. Back to you, Tim. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Uh, so as Kate mentioned, um, the project and all alternatives considered, other than the no project alternative, would include potentially significant and unavoidable environmental impacts. Uh, the ultimate trail configuration, or the trail next to rail line approach, which uh, was selected as the preferred and recommended approach, uh, due in part because it has the fewest and the least significant environmental impacts and constitutes the environmentally superior alternative. The ultimate trail configuration would involve less extensive tree removal, not require removal of the potentially historic rail line, and would involve less uncertainty than the optional interim trail approach as the ultimate trail configuration or the trail next to rail approach involves only one period of construction as opposed to three the three-part phase of approach of the optional interim trail, which requires three construction periods with undetermined time separating each construction period and more tree removal due to the need for greater corridor width to accommodate all three parts. The benefits of the proposed ultimate trail configuration approach are many and include improvement to aesthetics as shown here in the slide, um, as the project would facilitate public access to scenic vistas, allowing for uh, more views and more expansive views of the coast. It would enhance, enhance air quality and reduce greenhouse gas emissions through reduced numbers of vehicle miles traveled. It would advance the achievement of city land use planning goals through increased connectivity across the city and among neighborhoods, and improve public safety and services by allowing more ready access to parks and recreation facilities for emergency response. The project would also foster enhanced transportation options by reducing the number of vehicle miles traveled uh, for improved circulation and also for motorists, pedestrian, and bicyclists uh, enhanced safety. For the city's environmental review guidelines, because the Planning Commission is designated as the decision-making body for authorized to make a final decision regarding the uh, project entitlements, a decision regarding certification of the final EIR is likewise made by the Planning Commission unless appealed or called out by the City Council. Um, the Planning Commission is requested to make a decision regarding certification of the final EIR and adoption of findings of fact as well as mitigation monitoring and reporting program and statement of overriding considerations. Uh, please note that an errata to the final EIR has been prepared for minor inconsistencies and corrections or um, discovered after uh, release of the final EIR. Uh, please note that within its authority, uh, any member of the City Council may also elect to call up the proposed project as a de novo hearing but we would be expected to place heavy emphasis on the decision of the Planning Commission and rendering of, of its decision should the project be brought forward for City Council review. Good evening, Commissioners. Nathan Wynn, Director uh, of Public Works. So uh, tonight we're asking for a recommendation uh, from you guys, the Planning Commission, to take the following actions. So first is to adopt a resolution certifying the final EIR 
um, as known as attachment A as part of the staff report. Um, and then secondly, to also adopt a resolution approving the design permit, the modification permit, water course permit, <coughs> as well as the findings of fact, um, the statement of overriding considerations, the mitigation monitoring program, staff report with the conditions of approval that are attached as well. So, and with that, is that it? That's the end of our presentation, thank you. All right, thank you. So how exciting to see this last two legs of the rail trail going through. Any questions from uh, commissioners for staff? Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just was wondering, I, I understand that we're not going to be um, taking any action on the coastal development permit, and that's going to go through a separate process, but would there be any reason we wouldn't want to include in this re resolution a recommendation of our support for approval of that permit that would eventually get transferred to the Coastal Commission, or is that not recommended? Um, I wouldn't see any harm in the commission recommending uh, the approach for the consolidated coastal development permit. Okay, thanks. And I just had one, no, nope, I think that's it actually. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Paul Hamas. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a question about the El Dorado crossover. Um, is there any way to pull that back up on the slideshow? <laughs> Certainly, Commissioner Palamas, I can, I can uh, find that slide. Yeah, I, I just want to take a second look at that. Is there any active rail service going on right now in that area? Um, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Okay. That was my question. Because if there was, it... it so I, I can add just briefly to that. Yeah. So there are actually, um, so it's a designated active uh, freight line. However, the only active rail service in place currently is in the Watsonville area. Okay, great, then we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else, don't be shy. I had about 400 questions, but I talked to Nathan and staff and they've all been resolved, so. Uh, at this point, I'd like to open up the uh, public hearing to hear from the public. Thank you for coming. We're genuinely happy that you are here. Um, can I have like a, just a show of hands to get a rough feel for how many people would like to speak to this item? You're, you can change your mind later. Don't worry. I just like to see if there's 200 people or, or five, you know, so um, come on up. The process is you come up to the left here. Let's just change test. Tell me. And uh, line up on the side there and then we'll bring you over and then I given the hands raised I think we should do three minutes of uh, public comment each uh, please respect everybody's time and if somebody has said what you said already there's no need to say it again we hear you um, come on up Hi, I hope everybody can hear me. Sounds oh, good. Thanks. My name is Andrea Ruiz, and I'm a happy resident of Santa Cruz. I'm also a photographer, and I've had the pleasure of talking to a lot of people, especially tourists, because you can spot them. So I'd like to talk to them about why they come to Santa Cruz. And the main thing that always draws them to Santa Cruz is um, its original state. like. There's a lot of construction that's happening. There's a lot of removal of heritage trees that's really alarming a lot of us. And um, it's rapidly losing the, its essence of why people flock here. And so a lot of people would like to know if there's a way to retain more of its natural beauty and also you know, have space for progressive construction. But also, without the removal of the heritage trees, um, like there's a, a place on Front Street that, you know, is set to be demolished. And I know this may sound kind of woo-woo to people here, but this is Santa Cruz. I am a tree talker, very much like Horton Hears Who, but it's more like Horton Hears a Tree. So the trees there are really sad about having to be destroyed. 
they've been there a very long time, and they just like to flourish. Um, one thing about trees that people don't know about is they, they communicate like we do to each other and to us, but they do it so vibrationally. And so one of the things that they've been talking about is that they don't want to die. And trees do have feelings, and um, when they are cut down, they feel pain. When you, they see other trees cut down, they feel as much pain as we would in, in seeing a loved one die in front of us, uh, albeit violently. And so um, I'm here in part to represent the trees uh, of, of Front Street, but also the trees in the area, because they're very concerned about the way the city is being um, rebuilt, and it's losing a lot of its original vibe, and it's changing a lot of of the, of the type of, of um, things that we could do to flourish, like that Front Street area. Personally, um, I would think it'd be great to have like a plaza there, you know, with eateries and uh, maybe a place for live entertainment, picnic tables, you know, a gathering place for people because we don't really have that along the San Lorenzo River, you know, and a lot of people would gather there. You know, you could bring your kids there. You could have a safe space also um, commune with, the, with nature and be more aware of the ecological impacts that humanity has been having across the planet. Um, so in closing, I would just like to say that it would be a boon to you know, different businesses if that could be allowed to flourish and also balance out you know, what we're actually <clears throat> losing when we destroy parts of Santa Cruz that really naturally can't ever be rebuilt. So, yeah, that's what I'm proposing. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for your time. Uh, one other little note, the, the yellow light comes on when there's about 20 seconds left, and then when, when the red light comes on, please just finish your thought, and uh, oh, okay. don't feel like you have to stop at that instant, you know, but. Okay. Hi, my name is Dan Cambich. I'm I'm not a public speaker, so I had prepared something to read, but after reading your present or listening to your presentation uh, and how easily you dismiss the trail only option of claiming that it needs to be 26 feet wide when the normal, the ultimate trail is only 12 feet wide, I don't understand why it has to be over twice the width. Um, but anyway, I'll just read what I had previously presented. Um, I think that the, the RTC is perpetrating an enormous fraud with these claims that the benefits of this trail rail outweigh the environmental, environmental degradation caused by its construction. Their plan on cutting down over 400 trees in sections eight to nine alone and other vegetation, which provides homes and food for countless birds and other animals. You cannot demonstrate that there would be any significant reduction in vehicle traffic or congestion, the main benefit widely touted. There is an existing bus system that serves the same areas as this rail trail, yet the buses are near empty most of the day. You cannot demonstrate that a significant number of people would abandon their cars to bike or take a train if this rail trail is completed. The people who would ride a bike to work or shop do so now on existing roads and streets. This number isn't going to increase by any significant amount just because the trail exists. People are not going to take a train when they refuse to ride a bus. If this whole project is based on a future rail system being developed, you are now embarked on yet another study in hopes of this time finding some way of demonstrating the feasibility of a rail system when previous studies have failed. You boast of the desirability of this trail due to the scenery, yet you want to cut down much of the vegetation that makes it scenic to accommodate this future possible train, ending up with a corridor lined with retaining walls and fences. You never state the total cost of this rail trail system because if they know that the taxpayers would balk at the hundreds of millions, if not billions, required. Tax dollars could be better spent elsewhere to achieve an actual reduction in traffic and congestion. You downplay the tens of millions of dollars of annual cost required to subsidize the ridership of a train and the maintenance and policing of a rail trail, a cost to be borne forevermore. Another thing you don't mention is the increase in local traffic and congestion due to people from out of the area coming to use the tourist trail and tourist train which would offset some of the already insignificant possible benefits of the rail trail. You do all this under the auspices of a regional transportation commission, yet this rail trail has little to do with transportation and mostly to do with recreation. 
This is a recreational trail promoted and championed by the tourist industry and should be described as such. Don't pretend this is some green project when you propose to cut down so much greenery to build it. It's time to reveal the actual cost of this project in dollars and the environmental degradation and ask the taxpayers of this county directly if they want to spend their tax dollars on this boondoggle instead of allowing a transportation commission to decide for them. Drop the grandiose plans for the single track passenger rail system that will never be feasible. Remove the tracks and scale back this unnecessarily wide and expensive trail and save our trees. Thank you. I'm Vautje Svets, and actually uh, the previous speaker pretty much summed everything up that I was going to say. But um, the bottom line that I have is why don't you wait for the feasibility study? Why are you deciding now? It's what a year, year and a half away, and to make any of these decisions now seems a lot of waste of energy and talking and having meetings, and we don't know the outcome. So why even bother? And I really, really hope that you will wait making these final decisions and just, you know, it's been going on for years. What's another year? I mean, time flies, you've learned that. The one thing that I've not written down, but I really have to say this, Mr. Pohamas, I have never met you before, but I was truly shocked that you do not know if there is active train, whatever, on the rails by uh, Simpkins. That is something you should know. You can't make decisions here if you don't even know that. It's only in Watsonville. That's been going like that for years. Just a reminder, let's please be respectful of everybody. I I'm, think, I think I'm trying to be respectful. Are, uh, is not and this here. is really all I wanted to say. Understood. Plus that. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Chair Kennedy and Commissioners. My name is uh, Matt Farrell, and I'm here to speak uh, for Friends of the Rail Trail. Friends of the Rail Trail was formed over 20 years ago with the goal and vision of completing the trail between the North and South County, and currently uh, a number of sections through Section 12 have been have been uh, received funding from, there's just a mega grant awarded for the project. So the reason this is before you is because there's money and capacity to complete these two segments. And I um, say as a person who rides a bicycle that having a safe corridor for people to ride is a critical component in changing their travel behavior. And until we complete this kind of corridor, there's going to be barriers for people to use bicycle as a means of transportation. I think there's been a very open and uh, diligent process around this environmental review process. And I encourage you to support staff uh, the staff recommendation so that uh, we can move forward with completing this trail and uh, eventually building the rail line. Thank you. Good evening again, Commission. I'd like to express my support as well for the rail trail. I think the um, public's already spoken on this in a resounding way. Uh, I don't think we need any more obstruction. I'd also like to express my unqualified support for Commissioner Paul Hamas. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to speak on this issue? <coughs> Hi, my name's Craig Iman. I actually wanted to talk about parking, but <clears throat> given the fact that we're talking about the rail, um, here's a consideration. I don't know if anybody took this into consideration at all. <clears throat> Why not have, uh, I mean, do we need tracks? Why not have 
kind of an electric bus trolley system that doesn't require tracks. Doesn't that save a lot of effort, time, money? Go ahead and pave it over and then have a trolley system to go to work. Easy. Think of all the time and money we could save. Anyway. <clears throat> Thank you. That's it for me. Yeah. All right, last call. Anyone else uh, like to speak? And with that, we'll close public comment. At this point, I'd like to give staff a, a quick chance to respond if they'd like to any of the public comments and correct anything if you'd like to. Cool. All right, so now we'll bring it back to the commission for some more discussion and hopefully a motion in a second. Um, anybody like to get us started? Uh, Commissioner Masidi Miller. Thank you, Chair Kennedy. Uh, I'll respond briefly to some of the comments made by the public. This project is one of the most studied projects in this county's history, having been gone, uh, going on now for 10 years formally and about 20 years informally. Uh, this is a game changer, and the um, uh, demonstrated benefits of this project, uh, the benefits of this project have been demonstrated over and over by experts, uh, and I won't uh, waste the commission's time repeating all of the benefits that are, have been um, well documented. Um, when the chair is ready, I'd like to make a motion to um, uh, in support of the project. Was was that a motion? Because if it was, I'll second it. I'm ready for a motion. Let's do it, Mark. I'd like to make a motion that the planning commission recommend. Uh, to the council and take the following actions to adopt the draft resolution certifying the environmental impact report attached to the resolution as exhibit a and adopt a resolution approving the design permit slope modification permit slope variance and water course variance for the coastal rail trail segments eight and nine project based on the findings listed below and the conditions of approval and adopting the findings of fact under the california environmental quality act statement of overriding considerations and mitigation monitoring and reporting program attached as exhibits A and B to the staff report. Commissioner Masidi Miller, can I just make a point of clarification? Um, the commission can actually decide on the project this evening. It's, it's not uh, reserved to a recommendation to the council. Well, let me amend my um, motion to go ahead and approve the project. Okay. Thank you. Uh, go ahead. I'll second that motion. Great, because I wanted to make a friendly amendment. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, I had some, um, there was some correspondence around um, the, the Murray Street connection, and um, I would just like to make a friendly amendment, and uh, we'll see how this language <coughs> lands with the maker and the second. Um, I'd like to make uh, a friendly amendment for the conditions of approval. Um, that prior to installing the permanent pavement markings and accompanying signing, the city, city sh shall monitor bicycle motor vehicle interactions after the new, new dual bike lane right turn lane on Murray Street is in use during high use periods to determine the most effective permanent measures to install to permanent, uh, to prevent bicycle motor vehicle conflicts. Tess also has this language, and I'll try to read it one more time um, and not so stuttery. Prior to the installation of permanent pavement markings and accompanying signing, the city shall monitor bicycle motor vehicle interactions after the new dual bike lane right turn lane on Murray Street is in use during, use high, uh, during high use periods to determine the most effective permanent measures to install to prevent bicycle motor vehicle conflict. And the whole point of that is just that this is a very um, congested area, and we'd, I'd just like to see a little bit more special attention to make sure that we use the um, most effective measures to mitigate any of the uh, any of the um, in interactions that could happen in that area. So it's just basically requesting a little bit of extra attention in the final signing and marking in that area. Um, so we'll see how that lands with the maker and see if staff um, wants to say anything about that as well. I'm, I'm happy to jump in on that. Okay. Um, 
So with regards to striping and final thermoplastic, as a part of the normal standard construction process, there is cat tracking, essentially layout that gets done prior to final installation. So we definitely will, uh, as a part of our standard practice, perform uh, work where we are evaluating the actual line layout before actually laying down the thermo, but we can put special attention to that particular intersection great. to make sure before we lay down our final thermo. That would be great. Um, does that, is that okay with the maker? Yeah, you ask a question of um, our director of public works. Um, is the special attention being asked for in the friendly amendment uh, a burden to public works and will it prevent uh, or slow down the construction of the project? I think the only challenge, uh, as I heard rethinking the motion or amendment there is with regards to also the signage portion portion of it because it is getting approved all at one time. And so as we would make a change to that, it would have to come back for some type of um, approval at final uh, after final construction so that we are having design immunity with the project uh, once it's in place with the public. So it, I, I think it would add a little extra level of process should we have to make a change in that design. So my, my question, thinking about it, I saw this correspondence as well, and I'm thinking about this idea presented by um, the person writing the correspondence. My thought was that in order to monitor movement, you kind of have to complete the project. And to complete the project, you have to put in something Otherwise, you don't really, you can't really monitor a project without striping and signage um, until it's striped and signed. Um, my thought was that the, uh, you know, the, the design engineers of, for the project would have sufficient experience in working these kinds of problems in other areas to apply their good judgment, and that if it were problematic after the project was constructed, um, that that design could be amended, striping design could be changed after the fact if it turned out to be problematic. Would that be a legitimate approach? Yeah, that's that's a, another standard approach that has been taken where an installation is installed and it is evaluated and adjustments are made after the fact. Yeah, I'd, I'd be more comfortable with that approach. Um, I would hate to see a project be left without striping and signing while it's being monitored without signing and striping. I think that might be more dangerous than amending it later. So I'll, I'll uh, deny the friendly amendment. Okay. I, I would just say that um, the, there was purposeful um, intent in putting the word permanent because there's, there's temporary striping and signage that could go in and then um, that, that was the intent of the motion. But it um, doesn't look like I have a second. So there you go. <laughs> so I really support uh, your, your intent, Commissioner Dawson, and I walked some of these intersections just the other day. Oh, it's so Santa Cruz. Everyone's totally weird and unique. Like from an engineer's perspective, I just want to <laughs> feel your pain, everybody. Um, so I really want to salute that idea of being responsive. And I wanted to report that uh, me and Nathan had a really good conversation about this. and at least for me, he went through all the things I didn't know about how this works already with signals and, for example, there's video cameras that will read bicyclists for the first time. So that's a tool that's in this project that you guys can use ongoing to adjust things. And um, I had similar, very similar questions and was satisfied with the answers, so. If there's any uh, additional assurance, uh, the Seabright intersection, Seabright and Murray, or the Seabright intersection in particular as far as the rail trail crossing here, it is getting a lot of special attention. Um, we haven't finalized the signal phasing at that intersection, but as a part of the EIR itself, the combined right turn lane, as you, if you're uh, looking at the, the, the EIR, it extends, uh, it's quite extensive, and really the EIR is allowing us to have options for as we work towards the final design. And so there is a lot of, like I was saying, uh, additional work that's going into that intersection. So I do appreciate the comment and the intent from, from you and the um, person who emailed in. And so we definitely want to make sure that we, we get that right. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Any other friendly amendments or discussion concerns? Uh, Commissioner Conway? This is, is uh, really just um, I want to thank staff and the whole team for you know years of work on this it is um, an awful lot of scrutiny 
Um, I'm sympathetic to wanting to protect trees, and I appreciate that, um, the extra steps. And I also can say that the um, portion that's been built on the west side is such an incredible enhancement to that area and for getting around. And um, I fully expect having bicycled through this area for many decades. Um, this is going to be a, um, a great resource, and um, it's it's finally um, here. So, thank you. So, um, I don't I don't have much to say. I, I think we should go ahead and have a vote and pass this on as quickly as possible. It's fantastic to have funding. This is a meaningful moment. It's incredible to finish this trail. I'm thinking of the former planning director, Juliana, who we sat here for many years, and uh, she would joke, like, maybe I'll get out there on my wheelchair one day. And we're building this thing, so I just wanted to celebrate that for a moment. Um, I really appreciate staff. Thank you for leading me through everything. It was a reminder of all the process that had come and all the process to go ahead. This is like a 30% design, and I'm asking Nathan, like, what color will that thing be and he reminded me this is for CEQA purposes and we want to be as flexible as possible moving into actual design to give these amazing teams here and the people who aren't here the opportunity to adjust make things cost effective make things super cool you know and Santa Cruz style so um, it's my pleasure to like uh, request a roll call vote on this unless anyone has anything else to say. Oh, I have one more thing. It is urgent. Climate change. We got kids that are riding on this right now up on Bayview. So um, it's time to stop appealing. Please stop appealing and let's build this thing. On the first section, I forget how many trees, but like 10 trees died approximately during the appeal process for getting the permit. So I mean, that's just the most ironic thing in the world. For me, that's my last comment. Um, let's have the vote. Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Masidi Miller? Aye. Bohemus? Aye. Kennedy? Here. Aye. All right. Well, let's move on to the next agenda item. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Pull out that nameplate. I feel you, but the one closest to you, it's right in front of you. No, no, it's on the desk. Right there. See the paper? No, the nameplates. Yeah, just there we go.
Yeah, that was that was years ago. It's been since we've been through some social stuff. Yeah, this one's from Missouri Kid. Yeah, Missouri Kid. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad we're ready to go. Uh, welcome, Samantha. Cindy, thank you for the reminder. Let's move on to the next agenda item. And um, hear the staff report on the long address 530 Front Street project, please. Thank you, Chair Kennedy, members of the Planning Commission. So uh, my name is Samantha Hashard, and I am here um, uh, pinch hitting for Clara Stanger, who is the city planner for this project. So I have a staff report for you, and um, I will try to answer your questions as I can. Um, so this project is located at 530 Front Street. Um, it's actually located at several addresses, but that is the name that it's commonly known by. This is a um, proposed mixed-use building the project entitlements require approval by the City Council, and they technically do not require any sort of action by the Planning Commission, but the applicant has decided to present the project to your commission tonight to obtain some feedback and to get a recommendation to the City Council. Um, so you may have noticed that there was no um, notice of exemption or environmental document in your packet tonight. Um, we are still um, evaluating different paths for CEQA compliance. So um, unfortunately, I don't have a resolution um, for you right now, but um, we would still like to gather your feedback on the project design and um, other improvements. Um, and that will be prepared for the city council meetings that will be provided to them in their packet. Um, also, just wanted to clarify one additional thing. I heard from a few folks that um, the project is not subject to objective standards. So um, yes, that's true. The project was uh, deemed complete prior to the most recently approved objective standards. But just to clarify, those new objective standards that were approved, those are not applicable in the downtown area. Um, uh. Anyway, uh, we when we were working on that project, we found that the downtown plan already had sufficient objective standards. And so um, when we say objective standards, we're talking about the objective standards that are in the downtown plan, in the zoning ordinance. Um, those are also objective, but they're not the objective standards. So just clarification. Um, the project site is located in the downtown, surrounded by mixed use and commercial uses, and is adjacent to the San Lorenzo River. The project includes four lots, as well as a city-owned lot between those lots and the river walk. These lots have a general plan designation of regional visitor commercial downtown, and they're zoned central business district. This designation supports mixed-use developments and other uses as allowed by the downtown plan. The city-owned land has a general plan designation of natural area and a zoning of floodplain, which accommodates undeveloped land, including land designated for public recreation. Um, the proposal is to construct a mixed-use building with 6,865 square feet of commercial space and 276 residential apartments. I'm going to go through the permit requirements real quick for you. Um, it requires a non-residential demolition authorization permit to demolish a building on the site that is older than 50 years, a heritage tree removal permit to remove eight heritage trees, a lot line adjustment to consolidate the four par parcels into one, a special use permit to allow more than 50 residential units and to allow a public recreation use in the floodplain zoned area. It requires a design permit, which is required for any new development in the downtown and for developing the outdoor extension area adjacent to the river walk. Um, and then also associated with the design permit is um, an additional height request to allow the building to achieve a 70 foot, 70 foot height in the additional height zone B. Um, so that's processed as part of the design permit. Um, project also requires a density, includes a density bonus request to increase the number of units by 50% and to allow for several waivers to development standards and a reduced parking requirement. Um, it requires a revocable license for an outdoor extension area, the river walk. Um, and the project is also proposing several design variations to downtown plan development, which is um, another process that's allowed in the downtown plan. 
Um, and then outside of the city's permitting process, the project also requires approval of a Section 408 permit from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. That's to allow for the placement of fill between the levy and the building. Um, we have included a condition of approval that requires the permitting to be completed prior to building permit issuance. Um, so nearly all, all of the trees in the project area will be removed, except for one street tree along the site frontage. Um, in this diagram here, the tree on the left um, has already been removed. That one, um, I think it fell down. And so the tree on the right is the, the one street tree that will be retained. Um, the site has eight heritage trees, all of which need to be removed either because of poor condition or because they conflict with the project footprint or both. Um, these trees are shown um, as the stars in this picture. Um, the project is required to fulfill replacement planting requirements for the trees that are required to be removed solely because they're within the project footprint. Um, and so I also wanted to note that condition of approval number 20 um, references the replacement of four heritage trees. That should be seven. And so that would be corrected in the um, conditions of approval that are sent to the city council. Um, as I mentioned, the project requires a non-residential demolition authorization permit for one of the buildings. Um, this is the building. It is more than 50 years old. It requires, um, I'm sorry, it is located at 514 and 518 Front Street and was constructed in 1926. So this building was originally considered eligible for listing in volume three of the city's historic building survey, but the owner chose to opt out of the listing and so um, opting out doesn't mean that the project, that the building is not historic. It just means that the project is, any projects to the site are not subject to our historic alteration permit process or our historic demolition um, building requirements. Um, so it could still be considered a significant historical resource under CEQA, and it still could be considered eligible for listing on a local building survey. Um, the historic evaluation, the original one, um, that found the building eligible stated that it represented um, the emerging auto industry of the 1920s and it retained sufficient integrity to convey its significance. Um, however, the historic report that was completed for this project did not find the building was eligible for a listing. Um, the evaluation was completed by Evans and DeShazo and it concluded that the emerging auto industry is not a significant theme identified in the city's historical context documents. Um, and is therefore not considered to be locally um, historic. The evaluation also found that the original report, the 2013 report, was internally inconsistent in its discussion of integrity and that its analysis showed that the building actually did not have significant, a significant level of integrity. Um, so because the more recent Evans and DeShazo report provided a different conclusion than what the original 2013 report provided, um, planning staff requested a peer review to provide an independent third party opinion. That peer review was completed by DUDEC and um, it confirmed the Evans and DeShazo conclusion that the building is not eligible for listing at the local, state, or federal level. Therefore, demolition of the building is consistent with the findings for the non-residential demolition authorization permit and is also not considered to be a historic impact under CEQA. Um, so here is a rendering of the building. The proposed building is eight stories and is 92 and a half feet tall at its highest point, but the majority of the roof line is 89 feet. Um, the ground floor along Front Street in Soquel has commercial uses, a residential lobby, an inter internal parking garage, and then floors two through eight have the 276 residential units, and those range from studios to two bedroom units. Um, the project has been designed to meet the design standards of the front riverfront area of the downtown plan. The downtown plan calls for the part of the building at the Soquel front intersection, so that's this part down here, um, to be treated as a gateway to the downtown. The proposal does this with the pedestrian plaza at the street intersection, an articulated building wall, and outdoor dining patios along the Soquel street frontage. Um, so then variations to these downtown plan standards are allowed with a recommendation by the planning director and approval by the city council. This chair is slowly like sinking down. So <laughs> if all of a sudden I'm invisible, that's why. <laughs> like slowly. 
I'm gonna go back up, okay. <laughs> okay, so variations to these standards are allowed um, with a recommendation by the planning director and approval by the city council. And um, those are permitted when the variations result in a project that better implements the objectives of the downtown plan and the community. So one of the variations requested requires the development to be set back from the Soquel Avenue sidewalk by at least 10 feet. And that's to allow for generous gateway landscaping. Um, so the applicant has proposed to have the main building wall, the taller building wall there, set back at least 10 feet. But the external staircase shown at the corner, um, that leads up to the second floor restaurant and that takes up most of that 10 foot setback area. Um, however, this design does implement general plan and downtown plan, downtown plan policies, which call for enhanced pedestrian activity and connectivity to the river. Um, here is just another view of the building from um, the south on Front Street. And you can see that there's a consistent and articulated design that wraps around the building. Um, and then this is a view of the east side of the building facing the river walk and the north side um, facing Soquel. Um, so there's ground floor commercial and active residential amenity uses on the river walk as well as upper floor residential. And then there's the public plaza extension area that connects to the river walk. Um, so variation to the downtown plan development standards um, includes that the Front Street Riverfront development standards require that at least 75% of the river facing building wall must step back from the wall below at a height of 50 feet as measured from the Front Street grade. Um, so this was intended to ensure that um, the development is articulated when it's allowed to be built right up to the property line. Um, so um, in this development, um, it's set back from the property line already. Um, it's very well articulated and it has the appearance of three buildings with those large recesses rather than one large mass facing the river. So um, even without that step, step back, it still meets the intent of the, um, it still meets the intent of the standard and um, perhaps even more so than a building entirely constructed at the property line. And then the triangular area down in the corner here, um, that has been identified by the Public Works Department as the location of a future pump station. Um, the stormwater drain pipe um, that runs along the toe of the building um, may need to be improved in the future and a pump station is, is needed to alleviate the flow in the pipe and help solve other flooding issues in the area. Um, so while upgrading the pipe would generally be an applicant's responsibility, in this case, the pipe would need to be upgraded along several property frontages um, to function properly, presenting a cost prohibitive burden on this project alone. The city has applied for a FEMA brick grant to improve downtown pump station infrastructure that if awarded would cover the cost of the stormwater pump station as well as other improvements to the existing stormwater infrastructure. Um, the new pump station is in the conceptual stage um, but staff anticipate it will take up a substantial portion of that triangular area where the project proposes to include the outdoor dining patio, accessible pathways linking Soquel Avenue and the Riverwalk and the outdoor extension area plaza and a substantial amount of landscape, landscaping. The applicant also proposes to use a portion of this area to fulfill stormwater infiltration requirements for the project. So um, staff is recommending a condition of approval that requires the applicant to obtain a minor modification permit once the size and design of the pump station are better known in order to ensure that the outdoor improvements and the corner here is um, consistent with the downtown plan and other development standards. And to clarify, a minor modification is a staff level review so it would not come back to a public hearing. Is it possible to like kind of Point where that is. It's yeah. under those orange umbrellas there in that landscape triangle. Can you see I my think. Mouse in here? Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's this area here, okay. and it and it does. Um, uh, the conceptual plan does run into the outdoor dining area slightly as well. But it basically takes up this whole area. Isn't there always a big pump station wrecking your landscaping? Um, okay, this would be above ground, kind of a big thing, or okay. portions above ground and mm -hmm. portions below ground as well although it has not been designed yet. 
sorry to interrupt. Can I follow up? It's sure, exactly sure. that question. So um, because the pump station is going to be there, obviously those bike paths and pedestrian paths are going to be changing. Um, so um, we'll be able to see where it would be nice to know how is that access going to work um, once once we have the new bike path and the pump stations there. Yes, agreed. Any other questions? But what I'm hearing you say is that it's a minor modification, and although we do want to see that, we won't, right? right. <laughs> I just want to be clear. That's what's being recommended is a minor okay. modification. All right. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, so the other exception to the downtown plan standards that's needed is um, on this side of the project is to allow a greater than two foot elevation change between the river walk and the top of the outdoor extension area. Um, so you can see here that it steps, the elevation steps upward and that's why they're providing stairs. Okay, so in this, Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's got to be disconcerting. <laughs> Maddening. Hopefully it works better. Okay. Um, so we're still talking here about the change in elevation between the river walk and the building. So in this case, the site is physically constrained in that the difference between the front street ground elevation and the river walk elevation does not allow the project to easily meet this development standard. Um, when applying the required 15 foot first story height along Front Street, the second level on this side of the building starts at 32 feet above sea level, which is six to seven feet above the river walk elevation. So the proposed steps to the second story down to 30 feet, the proposal steps down to, um, steps the second story down to 30 feet at the commercial uses facing the river walk. Um, so this minimizes the vertical dif distance between the adjacent public plaza and the river walk while still retaining parking spaces in the parking level below. The proposed extension area plaza includes stairways, paths, a terraced amphitheater, um, seating, and that creates open and welcome con welcoming connections between the river walk and the plaza above. Therefore, the proposal continues to achieve the objective of connecting the river walk with the adjacent development while more fully achieving downtown plan objectives than a building with a substandard uninviting first floor height for the commercial and residential lobby uses along Front Street or a building that provides substantially fewer parking spaces. Um, and then finally, a vari variation to downtown plan standards is needed to allow for the stacked puzzle parking configuration. The downtown plan requires par projects to meet the parking standards um, that are in the zoning ordinance. And the project provides 171 of the total 181 parking spaces with puzzle stackers. And this is an arrangement that varies from those, uh, the parking design standards in the zoning ordinance. Um, each proposed three-tier stacker provides nearly three times the number of parking spaces as compared to a standard parking design with this, within the same area, and this allows the project to provide parking demanded by residents and commercial uses while devoting more physical space to commercial and public uses, residential dwellings and residential amenities. Um, these are uses that the downtown plan emphasizes for this location. Um, and then here we have a picture of the base density plans. The site is located in the additional height zone B, which allows height above the standard 50 feet up to 70 feet. Additional height is allowed with a recommendation from the planning director and city council approval. The downtown plan describes specific criteria and development standards that must be met. Um, so they must meet overarching city objectives, which the additional height does by providing additional house, housing and inclusionary housing. Um, utilizing a form that has the appearance of a grouping of buildings rather than one monolithic building. The project, has fi uh, the project financially contributes fair share to pedestrian connections between Front Street and the Riverwalk and a well-developed public plaza extension area adjacent to the Riverwalk. Um, the development standards for this project include that the top floor maximum 60% 
The top floor area maximum 60 is ma a maximum of 60% of the area of the floor below. The top floor frontage along Front Street is a maximum of 60% of the building length as measured along Front Street. And the upper building wall is stepped back from a 50-foot base height for at least 50% of the Front Street frontage and 75% of the frontage facing the river. Um, the project including the additional height of 70 feet um, constitutes the base density project, which has 184 dwelling units. So um, those two things are included in your approval today, an approval of the, a recommendation for approval of the additional height, and then following that, a recommendation for approval of the base density, of the density bonus. Okay, here is a rendering of the density bonus project. Um, just real quick, the project is subject to a 20% inclusionary requirement, um, and so that is required um, on the units that are provided in the base, base density plan, which is the fully conforming project um, that assumes the, an approval of the additional height. So that would be 20% of 184 units. That equals 37 units that are being provided as inclusionary. Um, and then 15% of those units, which is 28 units, will be provided at very, the very low income level. Um, so since this project is providing 15% of the base density units at the very low income level, the project is eligible for a 50% density bonus. This increases the total number of units from 184 to 276. In order to accommodate the density bonus units, the project is requesting several waivers from the development standards that would otherwise physically preclude the project with the density bonus units. These include a waiver to allow um, floor area ratio, uh, to allow a floor area ratio of 5.2, which is greater than the maximum of 5.0 allowed in the um, uh, CBD, I'm sorry, in the Regional Visitor Commercial Downtown Santa Cruz General Plan designation. Um, a waiver to allow a building height of 92 feet, 6 inches, um, which is in excess of the maximum of 70. A waiver to allow eight stories instead of the maximum of six allowed in the additional height zone B. A waiver to increase the base height from which additional floors must step back from 50 feet and four floors to 63 feet, four inches, and six floors. The waiver provides for... This waiver that I just said provides for an upper level step back from Front Street at 63 feet 4 inches of height instead of 50 feet and an upper level step back from the river facing side at 73 feet instead of 50 feet. So just increase the height of that step back requirement. Um, it also includes a waiver to increase the allowed top floor area for a maximum of 60% of the area of the floor below to 74% of the area of the floor below. And a waiver to increase the allowed top floor frontage along Front Street from a maximum of 60% of the building length as measured along Front Street to 62% of the building length. The project is also requesting a parking reduction to provide residential parking at a ratio of 0.5 spaces per unit, and that's consistent with density bonus law. Um, this is a quick map of the downtown area just to give you an idea of how the height of this building compares with other projects that are either entitled or in the pipeline. Um, this project is located at the north and the, um, as I mentioned the majority of the roof line is at 89 feet although there are portions that exceed that height. Um, the project directly to the south is the front riverfront project. That one achieves a height of 85 feet. And then to the south, also along the river, is um, a project that is in the pipeline, which is a hotel project that is currently proposed at 70 feet in height. Um, the project at the corner of Pacific, Laurel, and Front Street is currently under construction. That is at 85 feet. Project to the north of that is the Pacific South project, 100% affordable project. That's at 80 feet. And directly north of that is pa uh, PAC North. That one is 88 feet. Um, and we're also pointing out the 1010 Pacific project, which is 68 feet in height. Um, and then further to the west is the um, library project, which is also not yet approved, but that achieves a height of 84 feet. And then the um, Cedar Center Street project, which is currently under construction, is 46 feet.
And that concludes my presentation. Our recommendation would be to, um, for the Planning Commission to provide a recommendation to the City Council approving the project and acknowledging the environmental termination, which you don't know yet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you. Do the commissioners have questions for staff? Commissioner Conway? Yeah, I have a, just a, a couple of kind of operational questions. Um, and first of all, there's a lot to like in this project. And um, nice job on pinch hitting there on the, on the staff report. Um, so first I have a couple of questions, which is I'm just wondering how the developer and this is, you know, maybe considered premature, but I wonder, I'm really glad to see that they came in with a rental project as opposed to a, a map on the one hand, but I'm wondering how they manage access to the um, affordable units. Um, we always know how that happens with a nonprofit, but um, we don't necessarily, and this is a fair number of affordable units, um, so I'm just wondering how, they are subject to fair housing rules, but that tends to not be as rigorously enforced. So um, I'd just like to put that question out there. Um, also, um, I would be interested in more information about, uh, we, there was a lot of talk when, when um, these standards were developed about the community benefits that were gonna happen. And a lot of the community benefits are right along just activating that um, the bike, the levy is is huge, but I'm also interested in fleshing out a little bit more on how, what those were. You kind of gave us a brief description of what they are, um, and also, is there an intention at all to unify the design and management of you know what the look of the new buildings are going to be along the levy, which is you know just a tremendous asset um, to the city. Um, so those are the, my questions. My other big question, um, and you know, I appreciate you putting is are about height, um, and I uh, will talk more after um, we hear from the public. But um, I do have to say the um, the project without um, both the um, additional height bonus and the density bonus. Um, really looked a lot more like what um, I expected to see when the project came in. So what my question is, is um, I wonder if we are, um, and, and I think that we would be better off um, when these projects are presented um, without assuming that the um, bonus height is included in the base density and then we calculate the density bonus, um, that, that, sh that they should be separated. Um, because I think what we see in this case um, is, you know, it might be that if we were presented with both, um, here's the base density without the bonus height, and here's the base density if, if we're gonna make that including the extra height. Because we are gonna have a density bonus on top of it, it makes sense to have it. Um, but layering it on top of it, um, I don't know that it makes a better project, but I think that it would be a better process if we could, if we could say, yes, we're gonna get an additional, we're gonna go from, you know, what is it, 31 affordable units without the, the height bonus to 37. Maybe that's worth it. Maybe that's worth having the additional floor or possibly two. Um, but I feel like we'd be in way better shape, both with the public and also just in terms of getting the buildings that we, that we want. In the, these are important buildings, obviously, that they are changing how our community looks. And I think doing that with as much information and being as public and conscious about it um, is important. Uh, thank you. Commissioner Dawson? Um, thank you for those comments, Commissioner Conway. Um, I had um, similar things to say. So um, I would just agree with everything you said. Um, I think it would be much more transparent if we kind of had the base height of 50. Um, but I do have a question for staff, just for my own edification, because I am, you know, fairly new to this. So um, 
in the height zone that this project is located in, it's at the planning director's discretion to make a recommendation to, for that additional 70 feet, right? Um, and then that needs to be approved by council. Is, is it the normal flow of events that we would do something before that was approved? Um, I'm not. I'm not sure um, how to respond to like it being a normal flow of events, but I think we're used to, you know, seeing a recommendation from the planning commission before it goes to a city council um, decision. But in the downtown plan, it does it does specify that you wouldn't require the planning commission recommendation at that time. Yeah, I think to follow up on that, it really depends on the entitlements that are being requested. So um, many of the projects we see downtown have condominium maps. And under the subdivision ordinance, that requires a recommendation from the Planning Commission to Council. This is a rental project. Um, there's no special use permits involved. So there really isn't a, a trigger that's in the code that requires a review. OK, thank you. Commissioner Gordon. I'm new at this, too. So I'm wondering if now it's a time where we would get involved in the level of details like. I had emailed you, Samantha, or if we're waiting until after public comment. I think you should go through any that are okay. just question-based and just steer clear of discussion and political thoughts. That's for later. Um, and don't be shy. Fine details appreciated. Um, so I am coming from more of a design background, so I just have questions, um, you know, about... I mean, the pump station was one of them. You know, it seems like in the staff report it stated that there was going to be significant impact. And I understand the importance of also having it be a minor modification um, process. Uh, so I guess I'm just curious, though, because there is a very large impact to circulation. It is really a gateway, as you said, to the city. And um, the pump station is a significant addition to what we're seeing in these renderings. And so um, I guess I just wonder what what does that look like? What does that process look like if there's going to be significant change from what we're seeing and approving or recommending here? And um, so that's, that, that's one specific question about that. Um, and then Samantha, if you want to address them one by one or, or gather them up, that's fine either way. Sure. Um, if you wanted to, if your commission wanted to um, recommend that that came back to your commission to review, you can certainly do that. Um, I think our thought behind it being a minor modification is that we know where it could possibly be located. That's already been um, identified as the location in that triangle area. Um, and so what we're anticipating seeing is possibly the removal of vegetation, um, pulling back that um, deck area at the river walk or possibly eliminating that deck area at the river walk. Um, and so those are design features that we could review as staff and see if they can add any additional vegetation elsewhere on that side. Um, but um, like I said, if you wanted to propose to have that come back to your commission. <coughs> and just, just to follow up on that, um, you asked about the process. So. Um, the applicant would file an application and we would review it for consistency with the downtown plan. And um, from time to time, we agree to disagree with applicants. Mm -hmm. And um, there are provisions in the code that allows for staff to refer uh, projects to the commission, even though they might be approvable at the staff level. So, um, you know, we, we can and we have done that in the past. So, you know, if there were a policy issue involved or a, inconsistency, we, we could send it to your commission for review. Okay. I mean, obviously, I assume that, I not assume, I know that we're all on trying to get to the same place, which is that it's a gateway and we want it to look nice. So I just was curious, though, just. Um. If I may, yeah, uh, Nathan, uh, Director of Public Works. Uh, it's a great question with regards to the, the pump station um, being added adjacent to the project here. Um, so I just wanted to make, make it clear that the access uh, to the river walk and to the levee right there will still be maintained. We still want to make sure that there's bike and pedestrian access along this, um, along this corridor right here. Uh, the uh, 
grant that uh, Samantha mentioned earlier, the FEMA brick grant that we're applying for, also requires us to have look for some nature-based solutions or try to make the, the structure itself as um, amenable, and we want to make it look as aesthetically pleasing to the surrounding area. I think, um, Commissioner Conway, you also made a great question about some of it's going to be, or maybe you asked if it was going to be underground or above ground, and it's going to be a little bit of both. And so we are looking at actually potentially even trying to source the energy, place the generator maybe in a different location, but the pumps themselves and the pipes still have to be right at that location. So as uh, Sam mentioned earlier, it's conceptual at this point. We know that that is the point we need to tie in to you know, protect the rest of the downtown, but um, we do consider it a, a you know, modification, or minor modification. Thank you. Okay, so my next thing is, um, it's really difficult when we're looking at these um, to just talk about materials and materiality from an image on a PDF. And so um, I think it would be really beneficial for a project of this scale to be able to actually see those materials and how they go together. Um, and be able to comment on that. Again, I'm not interested in bogging down this process, um, but um, there's gonna be a lot of these coming our way, and I don't think that that process is a very thorough one for the public or you know for the city. So that would be one comment on that. Um, and then also I'd love to see an opportunity with pump stations and with the improvements of the um, pathway um, to really integrate art. I've been having conversations with the Arts Commission and, um, and economic development, and although we love the Arts Master Plan on the rail trail and, and integrate it onto the you know, riverfront, that there's actually no funding for that, but we do know that if we can get ahead of it and talk have these conversations that when construction is actually happening, all it takes is actually just identifying it and integrating it into the process versus tacking it on after and trying to find the money. So that, that's, mm -hmm. that's all. So um, maybe the question is like, how does that process, I have this question too, like how does yeah. that process go with the art? We see some pictures, it's historically like drastically underfunded, generally speaking. So do people raise money from private sources or can you just, kind of lead us through how that would normally go without us meddling with it? Um, we could probably direct the question about funding sources to the applicant, um, but what we did notice when um, Commissioner Gordon raised this question is that we did not have a condition of approval on this project that regulated when the mural would be required to be um, completed and the selection process for who would do, you know, who would be um, painting um, the mural, and so we do have a condition that we used for the Front Riverfront project. Um, I have that language drafted up. Um, we could add that to this project if you like. It basically says that there will be a subcommittee um, that includes a member of the um, Arts Commission, um, the Economic Development Director, and a member of the Downtown Commission. I can pull that language up in a minute. <laughs> Um, and that they would work together with the applicant to select the artist um, and then the condition of approval that it be completed prior to the issuance of occupancy permit. So um, we can include that. Thanks. Thanks for saving me for the fact that wasn't an official question. No problem. <laughs> um, I'll work on this. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I wasn't at the first approval of this one too, so I, I might be repeating myself a little bit. Um, just if I see um, Mr. M Mr. Miller, just one more follow-on question. That committee would be established at the council level? Because it's like all the commissions? You, do you, are you asking who would appoint those Yeah, would those that people? be established by council? Like we'd request it and then they'd do it? Um, that's a good question. I don't think that that is included in that condition, um, but we could ask well, that the Let's look at the condition later. Okay. That's fine. Yeah, I was just going to say if, if that condition were um, imposed, um, we would go to the downtown commission and say, hey, this is we have this condition of approval on this project. We need a volunteer to serve on this committee, and it would just happen through you know that advisory body. So. Okay. So similar to that climate thing we set up a couple meetings ago right. with like one person from each commission. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Masidi Miller, questions for staff? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a couple questions. Um, thank you for the uh, 
uh, excellent presentation. You're a great uh, pinch hitter, Sam. <laughs> Thank you for uh, stepping up to the bat. Um, I'm looking at the, uh, the approved downtown plan document that was uh, adopted by the city a few years ago. Um, and it identifies this project as being in additional height zone B, as you pointed out earlier, um, which allows up to 70 feet under specific conditions. And I'm wondering if you could uh, describe what specific conditions were identified um, that allowed the base height of the project to be um, 70 feet. Um, and I, I remember this project. I was on the Planning Commission at the time. This project, I mean, the, the downtown plan was amended, and it was, a, as I recall, many year process. And I think the intent of the downtown plan was that um, building heights would step up from the river towards the core of downtown, represented by Pacific Avenue. And when the when you showed the heights uh, earlier. I, I could see that the um, that's not happening. You know, it's like the heights of the buildings along the river are actually equal to, or in some cases, exceeding the heights of the uh, buildings along the core of our downtown in Pacific. And I'm wondering um, how that happens to be, uh, how we find that to be consistent with the intent, of the downtown plan as amended. Uh, those are my questions. Um, so the specific conditions that the downtown plan references are detailed in the additional height section. Um, additional height zone B has um, criteria for project approval, um, as well as performance criteria and other standards that must be met. And so when we're evaluating it for consistency, we go through those criteria and um, determine if the project meets everything. And um, in this case, there were some areas that it did not meet the criteria, and that's where they are looking for variations. Um, so I hope that answers that question. Um, in terms of the intent, um, um, unfortunately, I'm not sure um, how the, I don't know if Eric, you want to speak to how the intent was um, included in the downtown plan document. Um, but I'm not sure that there is criteria that says that the building has to step, you know, up from the river to the downtown core. Um, but I'm happy to keep looking in the, in the downtown plan to see if there's any language to that extent. Yeah. And the, and the staff report does go into a bit of detail, um, on page nine as to what each of those conditions are that, um, are required in order to go from the 50 to the 70 foot height limit. And then it also provides an explanation as to how um, staff believes those, each of those conditions are being met. And I can, I can summarize them if you'd like me to. No, I, I remember reading that. I'm just, um, thank you for the reminder. I'll take a second, second look at that shortly. And, you know, the other thing too is, as Sam mentioned, we have the, um, the variations that are embedded in the plan. And so we're looking at you know, whether it meets the intent or not. And then when density bonus enters the equation, um, some of that gets legally thrown out the window unless we can make a finding that there's a significant public health and safety impact associated with it. So um, it, it's a bit discretionary. Right, I recognize on, that. On at least the downtown um, variations. I recognize that, thank you. And, and the variations that you're referring to, is that the waivers that are being requested? Is that what you mean by variations? Well, the, the waivers are density bonus. Right. Um, there's also variations that are allowed as part of okay. the downtown plan that are separate from density bonus. Thank you for clarifying that. No more questions. Thank you, Chair. Anybody have more questions for staff? Or Samantha, did you want to answer any at this time? We could also do public comment and give you a little more time to, to study up over there. Sure. Um, uh, Commissioner Conway had asked about the community benefits of the project, and um, um, I think that the, we found that the uh, important community benefits here were the um, activation of the river walk, which is consistent with several general plan policies, as well as the um, San Lorenzo Urban River Plan. 
Um, and then the location of density in the downtown area, you know, in a transit priority area that's close to public transit, um, recreation, businesses, um, and not located in, you know, uh, neighborhoods. Um, um, and I think those were those are probably the community benefits that are um, achieved the greatest by this plan. Can I just clarify that question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Um, th there was also, um, I believe, there's a contribution that's being made to the the um, you know well, there's something expected to go on at the end of Cathcart Street, and is this project also is is there a contribution being made um, to those eventual? Community benefits, we haven't seen what they are yet, but we looked at a lot of possibilities oh, yeah, um, when yeah. the plan was being developed. Yeah, I'm not familiar with those. Yeah, the, um, this particular parcel doesn't have a uh, an access from front um, up to the levy path, so um, yep. they would pay uh, they a, a fee mm -hmm. um, to uh, fund their fair share portion of the cost of the various uh, paseos that are um, going to make those connections on other parcels. Thank you. So I, I have one more question while we're, we're there. Can you put up the, the one with the blue outlines with the heights again, please? Uh, the, the overhead view with the different heights on the diagram? The comparative heights. Comparative heights. The, like 85 the one you feet. put together. Oh, oh, okay. That yeah. one. Thank you. There we go. Yeah. So from the interest of everybody here, us, the applicant, the people living in this building, people who don't have houses in this town, literally everybody, we want this river walk to be awesome and very functional. And so I think it's fair and appropriate that these projects kind of like contribute to the grand stairway and those other big, you know, um, things that would otherwise have to be paid for entirely by that other project. So I'm really comfortable with that. I wanted to follow on with the, the missing teeth, as I call them, and just uh, hear from you how that will be addressed. I mean, it just is what it is with property, but are we, is this project, are all the projects all going to work together to make that as least weird as possible? And unfortunately, that is not a requirement of the applicant. Um, and also, um, the city um, has looked at those properties um, to, to purchase or to help fund, and, and there's um, no interest by the city in acquiring those properties. Um, I'm looking at some feedback that we have. Um, it, it just, it has limited value. It's too small to develop any like meaningful housing. Um, and it's quite expensive to my understanding. And so what we, what has been proposed for this project is a fence or a, a wall that's gonna block off that portion um, from this project site. Mm -hmm. um, but at this point, yes, it's, um, it's just that, especially the one that's to the south of this project is just gonna continue to be that parcel. Thank you, that's helpful. I'm thinking of that old kid's book with like the two skyscrapers and the little house <laughs> in the middle, so Purple that's house. development. <coughs> <coughs> all right, I, I think that's all the questions. Good, well thank you all public for staying till agenda item two. And uh, could I just get a show of hands for who'd like to speak to this item just to get a rough count? All right, that looks good. Let's do uh, th three minutes of comment again and following those same procedures. Oh, excuse me. We need to hear from the applicant before we do that. Thank you. I'll, I'll get back in the swing of it here eventually. <laughs> Good evening. My name is Jesse Bristow with Swanson Builders. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, that one. it's been a while. <laughs> I'm used. I'm used to Zoom. So. Um, yeah, and to be clear, you don't have a time limit. So. Uh, okay. Well, I'll, yeah. I'll be quick. Uh, Samantha did a great job. So good evening, uh, Chair Kennedy and Planning Commission. Um, so first off, I just really like to start off by by thanking uh, planning staff and Public Works and the respective departments 
it's been a really uh, long journey, <clears throat> excuse me, for this for this project. And um, Samantha covered a lot, so actually I think um, I'll just try to highlight the best things I can, and then we can stop on anything if you have any questions. But um, it's a little redundant. I apologize. And um, but first, I'd like to to start with the timeline a little bit. So if you could go to the next slide, thank you. So um, originally, we we prepared a, a pre application for this project in all throughout, well, majority of 2019. <clears throat> and we submitted a pre-application of 170 units at the beginning of 2020, uh, received feedback from staff. I actually think we held a community meeting for that one, and um, took, took the feedback, reorganized, and we submitted a full application of 170 units later in that year of, of 2020, early 2020, I might add. So, Obviously, you know, everyone was impacted by, by the pandemic. You know, we continue to work with city staff to try to achieve the goal of this uh, river walk and um, levy plan, the overall vision. And as time went on, um, California state density bonus went from 35% and was increased to, to 50%. So when it was originally 35%, it didn't really make sense for us to try to reorganize and, um, and, and apply for that, for that bonus. So. Uh, but with the new law, the 50% is attractive, and it allows us to provide more um, affordable units uh, in a lower income category. And so in 2022, we submitted a uh, conforming model that had 184 units and a density bonus model that had uh, 200, <coughs> excuse me, 276 units. And then uh, at the end of, uh, after a lot of different submittals and, and coordination with, with planning and the respective departments, uh, uh, we were deemed complete at the end of 2022. Um, you can go to the next slide. So this was our uh, first rendering, and it was very rough. And um, so I think with our team and the feedback that we got from the community and planning staff, we have a much better design. So next slide, please. So here, here's kind of the first iteration of, of our uh, 2022 application and it's evolved a little bit and one thing I will highlight is right now at the beginning of this photo you see that bare triangle we were actually approached by planning staff and parks department to incorporate that to create that river walk gateway and, and further achieve that that vision so um, we, we've modified it quite a bit and you can see the trail um, does not exist right now where we've actually added more <clears throat> and we'll hi I'll highlight that later in the presentation so next slide please Me. So um, under the, the 2022 application, um, there were further comments and we were uh, modifying it to, again, try to accomplish the goals uh, of, of the downtown vision in this river walk. So here you can see the, the two south towers. Um, if you go to the next slide, Samantha, you can see how we stepped those in. So that was, you could probably toggle back and forth if you, if you like. Um, so, and we incorporated, um, the river walk access with, with the, um, the LED lights, the signage, um, really trying to accomplish that goal to draw people from, you know, if you were on Front Street in SoCal, further into downtown, coming from Pacific Avenue, walking this way, you would be able to see the corner of the restaurant piece, that, that blue building with the blue tile, and really draw the eye of the user. And so it would be inviting to, to you know, come to, to the project on Front Street or the curiosity of the user to come up to, to the, um, the river walk and then leading further down to uh, the riverfront apartments and potentially in the future to the cruise hotel and then maybe the downtown expansion plan and maybe a new arena, who knows? But again, you know, our intent is, is to make it an active space for everyone in the community. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Samantha went over this uh, very thoroughly. Um, so let's see, of 184 units, six commercial spaces, including a restaurant, I will note the commercial spaces are conditioned to accommodate a food use. If that tenant was to come in, we just have one large restaurant space that's designated. So we'll work the tenants as they come along. Um, 181 parking spaces. We have a mix of two bedrooms, one bedrooms with dens, um, just one bedrooms, and, and quite a few studios. And we have a community workout room uh, that can accommodate a potential personal trainer use from a commercial standpoint. We have a community game room 
We have the public plaza deck that is accessible, uh, two private courtyards, private rooftop deck, and public space all along the levee. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is that, that same rendering. And um, as, oh, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> You're doing great. Um, so so uh, Samantha already went over this, but I just wanted to highlight the, the conforming model. And, and I'd like to segue how we got to our density bonus model. So you can, uh, next slide, please. And uh, I'd just like to highlight how this has changed. We have a staircase and kind of a minimal path to the restaurant. There is a bocce ball court. I don't know if that was mentioned. And, and we've been conditioned to allow, like, have a, the management team on that building to be accessible. So if, if you do want to program and use it, you know, that it's possible for the public. Um, so that. Uh, Can I just pause there? Sorry. So those are built by you guys, paid for by you guys, and kind of maintain that the public can access those spaces Correct. like certain times a day within certain limits? Yes, well, it, it's very much, um, I want to say like the Ma, but a little bit not, because it's, it's the Ma's uh, structured a little bit differently. But as long as those business hours are open, um, the, the public can utilize that deck. And, and then uh, where the building breaks, there are private courtyards for, for the residents. But it is it is intended to be like, hey, you can just go there and sit. You know, hopefully it's it's positive activity, and and you know there's retail and commercial activity. Um, but if you just want to sit on the amphitheater and look at the river, you can. Like, there's not you're not going to get in trouble or anything like that. But we did incorporate the amphitheater. Um, it was brought to our attention that there was an amphitheater in the San Lorenzo urban um, urban plan, but it actually doesn't or it can't happen because of the protected area, uh, to the best of my knowledge. So we, we try to accommodate. It, it does serve a utility purpose to where people can use it as a passive staircase. Um, but there's a little area that uh, I believe we are conditioned that to allow it for programming for, you know, maybe it's an arts club. Who knows? There is also a turnout for a utility vehicle. So it has multiple uses. And um, this was our first uh, kind of, well, this is one of many variations, but it's not final yet. And you'll see the final. We've just seen the, the final variation of it, but it has continued to evolve at the direction of staff and us really trying to achieve this concept. So, next slide, please. So um, as Samantha went, uh, went over, the, the density uh, bonus requirement is, is 20%. And um, we are, of that 20%, 15% are going to be low income. Five per, uh, I'm sorry, 15% are going to be very low income, and 5% will be low income, um, to the best of my knowledge. I think we, we left out. The 5% low income in the um, SANS presentation. So just want to be honest about it. Um, so that, that grants us a 50% uh, increase, which brings us to 276 units. So, uh, next slide. So overall, our project um, that we're discussing today has 276 units, the same amount of commercial spaces, same amount of, of parking. Uh, the mix has changed a little bit, but it's a still the same type of units. We haven't added any different uh, types, and we have 37 uh, below market rate units. Next slide, please. Additionally, um, it was mentioned that this is 100% rental. It's also 100% electric, um, except for the food use. The food use is the kitchen, commercial kitchen under city ordinance is allowed to have a gas connection, but this is 100% electric. Uh, by California green building standards, uh, by the time we're able to proceed with building permits, we'll, we'll be required to have uh, PV solar on the roof. Uh, we currently have 22 electric vehicle charging stations, and we have uh, 372 class one bike spaces, and we have 12 class two uh, bike spaces. Next slide, thank you. Uh, Samantha already went over these waivers, um, but we would just like to highlight that instead of waiving these conditions entirely, we move them to the density bonus floor. So we were, uh, meeting the conditions on the fifth and the sixth floor of the conforming model, but we we essentially d doubled the third and fourth floor. So the building got fatter, and then the fifth and sixth floor became the seventh and eighth floor. So um, we we felt it was important to continue and try to achieve the downtown design guidelines as possible. We're really just asking for these waivers so we can accommodate the um, the extra units. So um, we we did feel it was important to to stick with the character of the downtown. Next slide, please. Uh, Samantha already went over this. I will highlight that there are two transformer rooms. So as projects move forward, especially of this size, I would just prepare you yourselves in the community that when it's something's 100% electric, you're going to have twice, twice the equipment. Next slide, please. And this is our second floor uh, 
floor layout where you can see um, the various trails that lead to the deck, the, stair the two staircases, and then the amphitheater uh, leads up to the deck as well. So um, pretty much everything on the exterior of the, uh, the yellow colored spaces, that would all be publicly accessible. Those two courtyards in the interior would be for, for private residents. So um, we've, yes. I don't mean to break your flow. One more question, if that's all right, while we're here. Sure. So the deck is, would it be accessible or are those steps we're talking about? Like, uh, could you get to it in a wheelchair? Yes, in actually. A way that's not an elevator is my question. Yes, so at the yeah. corner of Front and SoCal, uh -huh. there's actually an elevator that brings you up to the, if that is the front entrance of the restaurant, you can use that. But if you're accessing off of SoCal and the levee, we do have a pathway that ramps up that is ADA accessible. Although there was discussion about the minor modification, we are going to do everything we can to to cooperate with with Public Works and their design. If that you know that does move forward, um, again we we want to attain this vision, um, whether it gets modified or not. Thank so you. Um, it's hard to achieve at the grades out there, if I remember right. So yeah, that's uh, mm -hmm. that's why we have that length and and again that variation um, about how the building steps, where it's fifth, where that Samantha mentioned where. Our floor plate on the front, um, the height of the first floor on Front Street is at 15 feet. If you if you go directly back to the levee, you're relatively high. And the challenge is is that it's higher on SoCal, and if you go towards the music shop, it's it slopes. And unfortunately, the Riverwalk plan doesn't really take that into consideration. It, it, it's very black and white. It says like, hey, this is 100% flat. So do what you will. So um, we we appreciate you know being accommodated in that design variation. So. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. And and this is the the top floor. Um, again, uh, we we are requesting that waiver to have the top floor a little bit fatter. If not, we would have to go another floor to accommodate the density bonus units, and that's very costly. We feel that it's just a little more appropriate to widen the the top floor. And I think we're at was that seventy two percent, Sam? I can't remember, but um, sounds right. Yeah, and we do have a rooftop garden, which is a nice amenity. Uh, it also acts as a, as a water capture and filtration for, for storm water. So it um, has a multiple function there as well. Uh, next slide. And uh, here are our perspectives. And um, this is, again, you know, as if you're standing at the parking garage above Oswald. Uh, next slide. And yeah, I just really would like to highlight, um, you know, from Oswald's to here, you know, we really, we really try to make the end cap of the building attractive and bring people um, up to the levee and, and really activate it. So, uh, you know, with the commercial spaces, the restaurant space, we really do hope that, um, you know, that it functions well and, and it's an attractive space that, you know, really helps not just people utilize our project, but, you know, future projects that are coming along and, and uh, the Riverfront project as well. Next slide. And this is uh, just kind of as if you're at the gateway of, of the river walk. And I think that's it. Next slide. Oh, that's from the south end. And one more, I think. There you go. And I'm here for any questions or clarifications. Thank you. Anybody have uh, questions for that point now? We can ask further questions later. Uh, Commissioner Paul We can hear from the public first. This question can probably wait. Okay. Either way is fine. I'll You'll be here. be here all night. Huh? I'll be here all night. Okay, thank you. Is that all right with you, Commissioner Gordon? <coughs> all right, now is the time to hear from the public. Uh, thanks for your comments. We appreciate them. And we'll do three minutes on the timer. Yeah. Oh, I should mention you are not required to, but if you'd like to introduce yourself, I was, yeah. I was like that. Justin Davila. Uh, wasn't here to speak about this project, and I live in Aptos, full disclosure. But I'm downtown a lot, lifelong uh, community resident, and I'm really of two minds of a project like this. On one hand, I'm really excited for this sort of residential, rental, dense project downtown. On the other hand, the densification going upward is really a cumulative impact, especially when you look at the densities that are being designed along uh, Front Street where a lot of those buildings are 84 plus. I'm sure the missing teeth are going to be 84 plus. I'm not gonna get carried away and call it Wall Street, but I will say that a darker downtown is a less attractive downtown. A darker downtown typically 
gives a different feel than the downtown that many of us are accustomed to and many of us are looking to enjoy, not, with, not just with our families, but you know, whenever it is that we're spending time you know, within the greater downtown Santa Cruz area. Uh, 80 feet straight up, is a, it's a big ask. And we've already got a couple buildings going up and quite a few more. And when you get those all together, it is going to feel much, much different. And my suggestion would be to really look at what happens above 50 feet. Look at step backs, look at green roofing more than even is designed. Look at, you know, architecturally really important aesthetic things that remind us of Santa Cruz that actually is attractive. And also look at structural heterogeneity. One of the biggest problems I see not only in this community but in others is the sameness of architecture. Whether it's a whole area being built all at once or whether it's every new building that goes in looks similar to the other ones. When you lack a structural heterogeneity, what you lack is a feeling of an organic community that came together naturally. Instead, you feel as if something's been imposed upon you. And, and if, you, if you look at the designs, it doesn't take much, right? It could be the addition of brick. It could be the addition of interesting woodwork or the art that we're speaking about. But when you get steep, similar buildings and you condense them all into one area, you can't really take the genie out of the bottle. Nobody is going to turn back the, you know, hands of time and be like, you know, we got this wrong. We need to tear this building down and make it look like this. That's not going to happen. And so, you know, we need to look, you know, not we, but not, you know, the planning commission, but also us as a community need to look into the future at what these areas are going to look like when they're completed. So not just what this building is going to be, but this building in the context of all of the other buildings so that we still have an attractive downtown that provides you know, an ample, you know, number of new residential units. We're all very well aware of the housing crisis. But I will say this. If density was the only way to solve housing crisis and increase affordability, then Tokyo would be affordable, Manhattan would be affordable, Hong Kong would be affordable. So it's not just about more, right? We do need to think about in context what we're building and not just why we're building it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Henry Hooker, and I speak as a representative of Santa Cruz Yimby. Um, we sent you a letter, so I won't spend a lot of time going through that. Basically, we think that this is a great project, that this provides a lot of needed homes, and it provides the density that we really need to have um, in order to accomplish our housing goals now and into the future because Santa Cruz needs to grow. Santa Cruz needs to grow so that it can have better transportation and that it can be more sustainable as a place to work <laughs> and a place to live. So the other one thing that's not in the letter that I would like to note is that we have more parking here than are actually required. And there are plenty of, uh, plenty of studies now available that show that when you provide more parking for residential uh, projects, you also encourage more automobile ownership. Um, and so I would suggest that you consider either suggesting to the council or that you take it upon yourselves to recommend that the density of, that the amount of parking in this project be limited to the amount that's actually required in the city codes. Thank you for your time. Hope that you will uh, push this project forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, if you'd like to. And uh, I forgot to mention, if you can sign in ahead of time, it'll just speed us up slightly. Thanks for asking. My name's Aretha Bright. Um, I the street from where you have your proposed development. Um, I am completely against it. I think it's a terrible idea. I am going to talk about the parking situation. As someone who works downtown, there's nowhere for us to park. We have to park 15 minutes away from our house and walk our groceries back up to our apartments. There's not even like a loading place unload groceries. It's really inconvenient. Parking is really expensive. 
there's no downtown permits except for the parking garages that are really far away. So if you're going to build a bunch of more housing for people where you have to have a car if you're going to live in Santa Cruz, um, this just isn't going to work. It's not going to work. Um, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? You sound fine. Uh, my name is Devin Salcedo. Um, I also live across the street from where this building would be constructed. My concern, apart from the whole parking situation, was only going to be half a parking space per unit in this monstrosity. Um, yeah, I was mostly concerned about the affordability of the apartments. Um, so you guys are requiring a 20% inclusionary rate, although the median um, salary for Santa Cruz is 78000 and $350, and the low income cap is $78,050, meaning that 50% of people are considered low income in this city. So how does that, I don't, the math isn't mathing, I don't know, it's, 20% does not equal affordability for everyone living in Santa Cruz. Um, yeah, I share a studio, and that's hard to freaking afford. And I have to pay for the parking across the street as well. And that's going to keep going up in price. And if you bring in a bunch of people into this new area, I don't know how the people who are currently living here are going to be able to afford anything. The prices are going to be driven up. This is literally gentrification. Um, what else? Um, the traffic increase. Um, the traffic in downtown is horrible already. I don't understand how this is going to affect things for the better. Um, and I'm from LA, so. Um, and the restaurant that's going to be included into the building, I don't know where they're going to park. I don't know where the customers are going to park for them. I don't know where the employees are going to park. Um, and I don't think the one little space for the public is adequate enough for the entire city or the entire people living nearby. And the building looks kind of basic. I don't know why, how it's going to be coherent with the aesthetic of the rest of the city. Um, if you put this here, it's going to not only change Santa Cruz, it's going to change it for like, it's going to look like every other metrop metropolitan city. And I feel like I moved here to get away from that. This would just turn this into another LA or San Francisco. And I don't know how many of you guys want to live there, but I mean, we're getting there. So thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Zenon Elliott Crow. I'm president of the uh, Student Housing Coalition, and I've come here today to speak in favor of this project. Um, I kind of just want to speak today from the perspective of the next generation of people that are going to be inheriting the climate crisis and really want to emphasize here that if we aren't growing here, we're growing elsewhere. When we don't build in the city of Santa Cruz, that doesn't mean the people that would have moved here just vanish and don't exist. It means they move out to Watsonville and they commute into Santa Cruz every day. It means they build a new suburb out in Antioch. It means someone else is building somewhere and taking up, you know, prime areas that are carbon sinks, that are, are natural areas that we should be preserving. And so when we look at this area that is in a very highly well served uh, by transit, walkable, it's dense, it's close to jobs, it's, you know, all, more and more as we're going to get the rail trail and we're going to get more and more transit facilities, it's in the best location we can possibly get. And we know that if we want to meet our climate targets, we need to reduce our emissions by building more densely. The connection between land use and climate change could not be clearer. And so looking at projects like this that are building at a density and building at a height, 
really we are talking about climate resiliency. We are talking about making sure we aren't sprawling and we are not continuing with the status quo of development. So I really want to implore you guys to support this project for those reasons and thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Ray Diaz, and I am a student and also Vice President of the Student Housing Coalition. And uh, following up with what my counterpart just mentioned, uh, this is an opportunity for Santa Cruz to also address a need for equity. Uh, currently, we work with a large number of unhoused students, most of which happen to be BIPOC students, happen to be students of color who, as of now, being with the current housing crisis, unfortunately can no longer return to their studies the following years because of how unfortunate they aren't able to find affordable housing within the city. And they don't want to unhouse people in Watsonville. They don't want to unhouse people in Salinas. We are also brown and black folk that don't want to displace other people. And so this, this plan is the perfect opportunity to address the needs that this community has been needing to address for a very long time to make sure that we have more students of color, more people attending the University of California and have the same opportunities as previous students from previous generations. Uh, so those are my comments and thank you very much. Thank you. Hi all, I'm Milan Wilkerson and I'm a second year student at UC Santa Cruz. And I already have to look for housing for the fall quarter and personally, I am terrified. Every single listing that I have looked for has pretty much been taken away in like a week or two. And it's mainly because anything that is affordable is so competitive nowadays. I personally cannot compete with a person who has a genuine job. I only work part time. And then not only that, but thinking of families that have a dual income, competing with that is nearly impossible for a student. So when you're looking at developments like this, it allows students a chance for you know, affordable housing that is available, well, semi, <laughs> affordable housing that is available in Santa Cruz to actually get that instead of people who make an income that's well beyond our reach at this moment. So that's mainly what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I, I had to write this down, so. Um, show of hands, how many people here rode their e-bike here tonight? Anybody ride their bike here tonight? A couple people. Okay. One walked. Okay, so. Um, Electric car. Okay, great, great. It's, um, now what if we tore down the Civic Auditorium and we put up 500, 400, 300, 400 units over there with only, well, we're parking deficient. Just 250 parking spots for thousand people. What if we tore down the library? Oh, sorry. What if we tore down the library over here? Put up an eight-story, seventeen-story building because we need it. We need we need the housing. I, and I agree, we do need the housing. <clears throat> but again, we don't give the share of parking spaces for all the people that are going to live in the building and use and have cars. Here's the issue. Um, <clears throat> I've lived in some of these areas. Well, I, I, I'm a business owner here in Santa Cruz. And have been for 23 years. So, um, and I've had a business just a couple of blocks. I, uh, an office two blocks from here. So, uh, that was 15 years ago. And, and even at that time, there was a thing called parking deficiency. So we've had parking issues in Santa Cruz for quite a while. Just all of a sudden, now we don't have parking issues anymore. They just went away. They evaporated. So uh, <clears throat> it's very interesting. So I've lived in some areas um, for a short time. San Francisco is one of them. And so I, I can confer with what some of these other people have said. It's very hard to park. You spend 20 minutes, and you're very frustrated trying to park your car. Um, sure, we, we, ideal world, we'd all have electric bikes, and there'd be, you know, but it's not. It's fit 32 degrees in the morning when I get up. You know, I didn't ride my bike here. Um, So recently, we, we removed 200 downtown parking spots. Gone. So we're putting up buildings that don't have sufficient parking. And this is going on and on. So anyway, am I chicken little? Am I just making this up? Is there no problem here? Let's look at last weekend. So I had to park downtown last weekend. 
I, <clears throat> my office right now is on, um, across from the Metro, 903 Pacific. So pull up, no parking. Well, why is that Catalyst had a show? Um, <clears throat> so I pulled over to lot seven. Oh, that was full. I pull up to the next lot. Oh, that's full. So I pull up to Walnut Street. Oh, full. It tells me in green letters, that's full. So I parked here. So we're, I, I think that you've had <clears throat> the idea that if you look at it from, from daytime parking, you see a lot of spots, but the reality is in during during a weekend that. show, when the catalyst is has a weekend show, there's no parking. So you should really look at that because if you're expecting people to come home or go go to a hotel, and they're going to park their car, that's not going to happen. Um, <clears throat> so one suggestion is you can go to Scotts Valley, and we can have parking there, and then people can take the metro to get here because they still have parking in Scotts Valley at the metro station. So we could set something up, maybe work with Scotts Valley, and then hotel res people who want to come to the hotel here, they park in Scotts Valley, and then they grab a bus in. All right, so well, thank you. Consider that. Mm -hmm. Mike Fenari, uh, my question is regarding the, um, the pumping station. It was mentioned a couple times, but in no detail at all. Um, it says it might be parked down. Partly subterranean, partly above. We're talking about five feet above, 50 feet above. I mean, what's the purpose of this <clears throat> of the pumping station to begin with? And then, it sounds very industrial. How is this going to impact the aesthetics of the projects and and downtown? I mean, it <clears throat> it's a, an issue that was touched on just very briefly a couple of times, but. Um, no sort of detail at all was presented on it. I'd like to know a little bit more about uh, the, the size, shape, and function of the pumping station. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for your service. This proposal meets the goals of the general plan, the downtown specific plan, and helps meet your arena goals. Meeting the arena goals is a challenge, and if you do not maximize downtown parcels, then it's a lost opportunity for the piece of land. Putting nearly 300 housing units in a single family home neighborhood would be far more disruptive than where people can actually walk to services and eliminate vehicle trips and the associated greenhouse gases. The downtown needs more residents to support small business, and this development will help. The state has spoken it wants housing. Density bonus comes with legal protection for applicants that restricts cities from denying housing. Thank you to staff for highlighting the four foot difference between this proposal and the adjacent entitled development. Development along the river allows for general public access to the river walk and dissuades deviant behavior. This is a great project and only thing better will be when it actually opens. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I think everyone's spoken who would like to. Last call for public comment. With that, we'll close public comment, and then I'd like to ask staff if they'd like to respond to any of the, <coughs> the comments. Yes, thank you, Chair Kennedy. I just um, wanted to speak to the comments that we received about parking real quick. Um, the project does comply with the parking requirements for density bonus state law. So that is a state law requirement and it allows for 0.5 spaces per unit. Um, new state law is um, AB 2097 that would allow for zero parking on this site. I just wanted to make that clarification. Let's um, say that again, loud. the new state law might allow for zero parking, zero parking for a project like that, just to emphasize what you just said. Um, and then uh, one of the comments we received was regarding the pumping station, and I would um, defer to um, Nathan Wynn, the Public Works Director, for additional detail on that. All right. Uh, Nathan, do you want to come up and just, like, describe the pumping station a bit more? I keep thinking of, like, Mario Brothers, but I'm sure it's not like a green <laughs> pipe, right? Uh, that is one of the odd design options on the table. <laughs> it's still in the concept phase. Um, 
So the pump station um, is, as we, dis as we discussed earlier, would be on the corner of where the bridge abutment and where the building would start. Uh, right now, <clears throat> the pumps themselves would be submersible. That's what we're imagining right now. There'd be a wet well. Um, not sure exactly how deep, uh, maybe in the neighborhood of about 15 feet. And then we'd have to get penetrations that go through the, the um, levee structure. So there'd be a section 408 permit that goes with that as well. Uh, above ground, what we're looking at is we'd have to have a control panel that, for the actual pump station and an electric generator, a backup generator, because this is considered critical infrastructure. But as I was mentioning earlier, we're trying to figure out that footprint for the, for the energy source, for the power source. And so we're trying to maybe potentially put that on the other side of the SoCal Bridge to, to make that more inviting on that particular corner as you're um, entering the downtown area. Um, minus, um, as I said, we're in the conceptual phase, so we don't really have any plans, like drawings, you know, size and scale. But um, again, we feel that at this point with the feasibility study that's been performed, that it can fit in that area, and that we can also, again, have uh, access for the um, levee trail itself. All right, Lynn, that helps. Oh. Yeah, uh, I'd Mr. like to, um, first of all, I think we can all appreciate why it's really important to have a pump station. So, <laughs> and um, um, thank you for your efforts to make it less obtrusive, um, because I think that is really important, as we've stated, it's an important corner. Did you say there's funding through FEMA for this? Or did I make that up? Or is this is it? Because it seems like this is this is on a track. This is moving. That, that's correct. So we're working on getting this project into our CIP. We've already actually moved forward with applying for a FEMA brick grant. Mm -hmm. So that's in process. It's actually been approved through Cal OAS and then kicked up to FEMA. So we're actually waiting for uh, whether it's going to be funded through that program or not. Yep. Thank you. Any other response? All right, so with that, we'll uh, bring it back to the commission for a motion and further discussion. Commissioner Conway. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's a few things um, to discuss here. And first of all, um, again, thanks to everyone who's worked on this project. It is um, amazing to see it come this far. I really did feel kind of gobsmacked by the expecting 50 feet. I was expecting to have um, you know, a density bonus, of course. Um, I didn't expect the density bonus to go on top of the additional height. When you put up the six-story building, I thought, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what, that's what we were th looking for. And, um, you know, I'd like to emphasize that I think that there were some good reasons to have it stepped up. And, of course, the density bonus is affording us the opportunity to actually make dense projects feasible. Um, I, I couldn't be more supportive of the density bonus, and um, but I do feel like um, the the one piece of discretion that we've retained is um, whether or not um, the density bonus calculation is based on a base project without the additional height or a base project with the additional height. Um, and I think it's important to emphasize that that's our discretion. And I'm glad it's not that we can't, we, we can't turn down a density bonus project. We shouldn't be able to. Um, but it is also important to note. And I feel like um, it's important to frame these projects in that light. This is the base project without any additional height. You know, this is what it would be with a density bonus. And then this is what it would be with the you know, discretionary additional height and density bonus on top of it. I think it makes a difference. Um, so I just want to be really clear about that. All right. Uh, any response or anyone else want to speak? You had a question, Commissioner Polyamus? Yeah, thank you. Um, I did have a question. So we do have a good amount of information on the mix of units in terms of micro studio, one bedroom, one bath, one bedroom, one bath den, and two bedroom. What I don't see anything about is how the affordable units are going to be spread, and I wondered if the applicant had any information about that. Oh, and I'm not sure if you have this information either, but not only spread between types of units, but spread between floors, if there's any type of information on that.
<laughs> Everybody can just come up if you right. want. It's fine. <laughs> Hello, Chair and Commissioners. Lee Butler, Planning Director for the City. And um, the code requires that the, um, the inclusionary units be comparable to the, um, uh, the number of bedrooms that um, are distributed through the um, project. So if it's, um, you know, 20% uh, two bedrooms and 80% one bedrooms, I don't know the exact mix on this, um, then the inclusionary units would need to meet that um, same spread between number of bedrooms. The code does allow for the units to be 75% um, of the size of the market rate units. So um, they can be slightly smaller, um, but the bedroom count distribution is the same. Okay, great. And then um, just in terms of distribution, you know, over floors, like how many, are they all jammed on the second story? Or are they all put on the third story? Or is there sort of a spread all the way up to the top? Or it, if you don't know, that's okay too. I'm just curious. Sure, I, I don't know that, but I don't think there's anything that calls out on which floor they have to be on, just as long as the percentage is, is matched. And I would like to highlight that there would be no reason for us to minimize a unit to 20 or 75%. Um, it just doesn't make sense when we're designing a building to have that. So it just it's easier when everything stacks. So I just, just want to express that. Great. Thank you. Commissioner Paul, I miss. Um, the, the code does say that the inclusionary units shall be spread throughout the residential development to prevent the creation of a concentration of affordable units within the development. So we would expect that they be dispersed throughout. Yeah, and that was something that kind of popped in my head from other developments that had similar um, had a similar outcome, so yes, thank you. So the way it's implemented is, um, as a condition of approval, the applicant enters into an affordable housing development agreement, um, and that's reviewed for consistency with the ordinance by our economic development staff. So all those de details get worked out before the um, building permit gets issued. There was a comment earlier about how that is managed and that we would have on-site management working uh, in tandem with that agreement with the housing department. Um, they review certain things like the lease that, that's established for potential tenants and they report, you know, if someone's moved and has it and notifies uh, the housing department if a, if a unit's available, things of that nature. So the housing department actually allocates um, the rental units? We have an agreement with them. I believe we, we I, well, there's a draft, we would work on a draft agreement and we would identify which and where and then um, it would be established, and then there's just continual reporting to make sure that we're in compliance. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson, I didn't catch you was first. Oh, okay. Uh, I think I was looking down as well. Thank you, um, Chair. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we've the we've kind of turned to talking about affordable units. Um, I, I think uh, we can all agree uh, that we are in an affordability crisis. And we talk a lot about the density bonus, so I just want to put on the record for the public once again um, that because of the density bonus, we're only, there's 276 units and we're only 13% of those are going to be affordable units. Um, that is the letter of the law, but it's only 13%. Um, and that's not going to meet the need. And I also want to put on a record once again and make a recommendation um, at least publicly and to the council because I don't think I have support to make one formally with votes that um, a legal council has weighed in. Our city council could choose to increase the occlusionary percentage for density bonus projects so that we would end up getting 20% of the total units of a project, which is not what we're getting right now. Again, we're getting 13%. Also just want to recognize the residents and um, the equitable issue around parking. Um, I, I think that, that you know, the climate crisis is real. There is no doubt. That is literally my day job. Um, I, I'm in it all day, every day. Um, but we also have to recognize where we are right now and think about the equi equitable access um, to living in these spaces and then being able to get to work because we all want a transit um, option that could get us where we need to be. Santa Cruz is a service economy. 
Um, you don't have flexibility. If you have a nine o'clock sh shift and a bus doesn't get you there, you need a car. I'd also like to recognize that we are recovering from the impacts of COVID um, to our downtown economy and our small businesses, and there are only so many jobs downtown. So um, I think we should be planning for the future, but I just wanna recognize that um, we need to be building way more affordable housing. This developer is getting seven waivers, which again is the letter of the law to build this building and only providing 13%. So I just wanna encourage the council and hopefully my other commissioners to get behind the idea of raising the inclusionary for density bonus projects in the future. Thank you. All right, uh, Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> I appreciate all these really big <laughs> comments that you all make. Mine are gonna be really granular. <laughs> so um, I had, couple more things that I had questions about um, that um, I have some questions about the <laughs> trash access for the commercial spaces that are facing the levy um, in the conditions um, of approval you know the flexibility of those spaces is critical you know and um, I'm having a hard time kind of wrapping my head around if those spaces were to be restaurant or something that would be you know, what, what are they gonna be and how do they access trash and get delivery? Even with that restaurant on the corner, I'm kind of curious how that, that's gonna work there from a access perspective. Um, I would defer to the applicant to address the question of, you know, how deliveries will get to the restaurant on the second floor. Um, but also um, we do have uh, Nathan here from Public Works who may be able to better speak to how the trash enclosure is sized to appropriately handle a restaurant use. Um, we could include it as a condition of approval of the project, but I'm not sure if the spacing would allow for that as it is now, so. Right. Well, I think that was kind of my question is I saw the trash enclosure and I saw the path to the trash enclosure and I saw where the commercial spaces are being proposed and it seems impractical, like it's just limiting basically. And so I just, maybe there was some thought process around it. And then, yeah, the delivery thing. Yeah. Uh, come on up, Mr. Briscoe, or Nathan, whoever. Hello. Um, so I do believe we provided as part of the plans a trash access. Um, are you referring to that sheet? Yeah, that, um, I mean, that's what we tried to accommodate in order to show that path. I will say it's not, it's not, that's the challenge with having commercial on both sides in this type of project. Um, idea, ideally, you know, there is still elevator access if they were to go all the way around. But again, I believe the plan set, I don't know it by heart, um, still allows workers to access the stairwells down to that trash enclosure. And we've worked, I believe the project is conditioned to, as far as trash pickup, we have uh, bins in there and compactors. It's very, uh, uh, similar to our project at um, on Park Pacific, our Park Pacific project. Sorry, my architect's texting me, so he might be more helpful. <laughs> That's right, we're on Zoom. <laughs> um, oh, there's a trash chute as well. Okay. Go down. Uh, so that would be um, helpful. And as far as trash pickup, uh, we've worked with Public Works too, um, because we have on-site management. You need that with this type of project. Um, when trash does come, we're conditioned to remove it like within two hours and then it goes back in, so there's not any impact to traffic and, you know, looks. And I'm, I'm assuming that somebody's thought through this, it just wasn't really clear from the plans, but also delivery, like that the restaurant gets these deliveries, where do those trucks pull up and, and deliver all the things? And we've just seen that in so many tenant improvement issues of, of, of how that works, and, and those particular units are complex in their location so i just didn't see sure it, it depends on the size of the vehicle um i'm not i don't believe there's a loading zone on the street now so they would have to pull into the driveway of that access and, and load there um so i you know whatever vendor they're working with i think they need to make sure what kind of size truck they're using yeah thank you And I'll just add to that with regards to the uh, operation service. So we do work with the developers as a part of the review of the plans to look at trash enclosure, how the operation is going to work. In this case, especially in the downtown area, area 
uh, oftentimes all the all the pickup is going to be on the street in the morning and as, as Jesse mentioned earlier we have a certain time frame which it can be out there and it has to be picked up while we realize it's in the downtown core it's a lot of basically of how a lot of our businesses work currently right now where their trash is behind the business they bring it out we do the collections in the morning and then they have to put it back so that um, the rest of the down can operate normally with regards to the loading zone uh, space unloading and loading for commercial though that is that is quite a challenge. We are talking about that curb management, potentially setting up some type of policy in the future, working with the planning department on that kind of thing. Uh, there are some developments, but we are um, looking at trying to provide that type of use, kind of a multi-use curb where it's going to be parking, normal parking during the day, but in the mornings or evenings we allow for commercial use and or um, uh, deliveries for like Amazon or you know DoorDash, those kind of those kind of businesses, Ubers, etc. And so we are trying to. Think about that kind of modernization, how we're kind of managing our, our roadways uh, with regards to these um, large development projects where we, have, we know we have a concentrated amount of um, housing. Right. Thank you. Okay, another granular thing. Um, the balconies are really prominent in the design on that, and um, I'm just wondering how the management of that is going to work um, in terms of the tenant's use of those. Um, I know you're no longer the owner of 555 Pacific, but it is an example <laughs> of some out of control balconies. <laughs> sure. So um, we absolutely could work with our management and, and part of the lease that say like nothing unsightly, you know, um, or it's kept in good order. Um, probably maybe something a little more objective so we can point to it and, and just ensure that they're compliant. Uh, I think Commissioner that's all. Gordon, that that's also something we could include as a condition of approval, if you like, for them to for us to require them to include that requirement in their um, tenant leases. Um, but as Eric pointed out, that's a little diff difficult for us to enforce and regulate, right. um, and it would be a fairly low priority um, complaint if it came in. But it is something we can include as a condition of approval. Right. I mean, I don't want to overcomplicate things because if we can't monitor it, it's just another rule. But I wanted to bring it up as a a, a serious concern because there's it's a it's a high impact corner. So I don't want to overcomplicate things by that by doing that. But I wanted to say it. <laughs> by my memory, we've added that condition to like a whole ton of projects in the past, and it's nice to have it there, like just in case. Um, Am I remembering that right, Eric? Yeah, we. I know we've done it on some standard, but some projects. Before. Yeah, I mean, your point's well taken, given the visibility of that corner. Um, and I think by making it a um, the condition tied to the lease, it, it sort of helps us with enforcement in that it becomes the management company's issue, okay. rather than the city and the individual tenant. Okay. Um, but as the applicant pointed out, having something objective. Um, in that condition would really help with enforcement, like nothing on the, the railings or something to that effect. I don't know. I'm, I'm like too new at this to plants on your balcony, that craft kind of perfect thing. language. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a 30,000 feet person. I'm not a, a language pick. I'm not a crafter in that way, so. I'll draft something what up the, Okay. Yeah. And, Thanks, and Sam. This would go to council, so there'd be some time there for staff to catch up a little bit. Especially since Samantha's dropping into the project, Commissioner Paul Amos. And I would just say, um, Commissioner Gordon, that you know, not on Pacific has um, my understanding is a similar agreement, and that is a very visible building in terms of coming down the hill there on uh, Mission Extension, and so I think that's an important point. Okay, those are all my questions. All right. Thank you. Commissioner Messini Miller, I'm feeling like we should get a motion here pretty soon, but go ahead. Thank you, Chair Kennedy. <laughs> um, I have uh, some comments. Um, I want to, I won't repeat um, Commissioner Conway's comments earlier about the pro process, um, but I do support them. Um, I'm also want to respond a little bit to Commissioner Dawson's comments about the inclusionary percentage of units. Um, I, I am uh, very much an affordable housing advocate, 
And while 13% sounds like a very low number, I'm also aware that in that 13%, there are 28 units which will be allocated to very low income residents. And if I remember right, um, in the last housing cycle, we didn't meet the requirements for the very low income units because they're extraordinarily difficult to build, uh, f feasibly build and economically build so that they're including this many units in this project impresses me. And so I'm less worried about the quote number percentage than I am about the quality and affordability of the units that are in this project. Um, so I, I'm, I'm happy with the, with the number of units and especially the affordability of the units in this project. Um, with regards to some of the comments that uh, the general public made, I want to um, echo those as well. Um, one of the speakers mentioned that if we don't build here, we will build somewhere else. Not we, Santa Cruz, but the human race will build somewhere else. And I have seen lots of that building in other places. And in, in my youth, we called that sprawl, and there was a big anti-sprawl campaign launched by the National Sierra Club, and this was by 1980. And um, I'm sorry that uh, sprawl continued, even though there were many people that were against it, at least a few people that were strongly against it. And I am glad to see projects like this because it means that sprawl is coming to an end, and we need to end sprawl. It's really an inefficient use of land. It uh, really destroys uh, green fields in every sense of that word. Um, and for that reason, I support this type of project. Um, I was also acutely touched by the comments made by some speakers about the equity issues. And as one speaker said, this project will give students a chance and I don't think it just gives students a chance, but many young people in this community who really are struggling to find a place to live. I moved here in 1983. I know it's maybe before some people in this room were born, um, but when I moved here, it took me six weeks to find a place to live. Um, housing was really hard to find then, and it's only gotten harder. I can't even imagine what it's like to be a young person today looking for housing in this area. Um, and so I, I, I sympathize. I, um, I can relate. and I sympathize with, with people who are struggling to find a place to live. Um, and the very last speaker, I thought, just kind of nailed it. Um, at the risk of being somewhat repetitive, you know, this project meets the general plan goals, makes a significant contribution to meeting our arena numbers, and it helps us solve the housing crisis. Um, so those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner Dawson? That's okay. Yeah, just a quick response to um, just put some numbers to some of those words. So, um, in, so uh, in this project, we will be getting 10% very low units. Absolutely correct that those are, are the units that we've underperformed in building. Um, but right now, the average median income in Santa Cruz, um, the state law creates um, income levels and how, how much certain size units cost. So if you, if you go to the Housing Authority website, you can look at these things. So 100% of a, a one-bedroom unit, the market rate rent now is, is according to them, $2,900. So... If you're looking for a studio, it's over $2,000. So we, we have to put this idea of equity and affordability into actual numbers here in Santa Cruz. And I think that's really important when we talk about equity. Um, and, and for your average worker in Santa Cruz, um, the, the, the wage needed to afford rent at market rate is over $40 an hour. Um, and those are all available online and cited. So I just want to make sure that we're putting in context these words that um, we all like to say and um, absolutely agree with um, the staff and the commission that this 
does meet the letter of the law, what I am proposing is that we have the ability in Santa Cruz to change that, and we're choosing not to do that. Thank you, Commissioner Dawson. Uh, Commissioner Conway? Um, this is really um, a question not related um, specifically. I just kind of want to raise it. We've talked a couple of times. I feel like we do it a little bit every meeting about um, wishing we had a design committee um, or a way to provide um, input not to slow projects down or to return them to the commission or to, you know, add an, a layer, but to provide an opportunity for feedback. And I'm just, I'd just like to raise the question of what would it take to create something like that I'm, and where would it be? I mean, someone suggested a subcommittee of this commission or would it be a collaborative with um, other appointees? I'm just, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. I just feel like it's been something that um, we've wished for for many years since we were, you know, back in the corridor plan days. And it just seems like more and more um, um, a project like this, I, I really think it would have benefited from just, um, and by the way, I think it's a beautiful project. Um, but I think the opportunity to, to say, even ask the question of, is this feasible um, without doing the, you know, double bonus? Um, would it still work? We don't have a chance to ask that question, so we don't have a chance to really examine. Um, and I think that would would have come up through a design committee, um, mm -hmm. just because it's further discussion and kind of talking it over. So I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know where it comes from. Yeah, I've got a couple comments <coughs> about that. I feel like we should get a motion in a second, and then okay. I've got like three more things to talk about, and then um, see if anyone has more discussion. Is somebody willing to make a motion? Commissioner Paul Hamas? Yeah, I'll, uh, before I do, um, Samantha, you said at the beginning of the meeting that we're, something had changed. We're, we're still making recommendations on the approval of these permits, correct? That's correct. You're going to make a recommendation to the city council. Okay. Then I'll move uh, to recommend approval of the lot line adjustment, non-residential demolition authorization permit, special use permit, design permit, additional height request, density bonus request, revocable license for outdoor extension area, and heritage tree removal permit with design variations to the downtown plan development standards to city council based on the environmental determination, findings listed below, and the conditions of approval listed in exhibit A of the staff report. Dated February 24th, 2023. Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Commissioner Messini Miller, for the second. So, I've got a few things to talk about. Um, I was a member of the downtown plan subcommittee that that made these awesome objective standards. I'd forgotten they all made it through the cut, but that's something else. Um, it's very exciting for me to see so many parts of that plan coming true, and I want to go back to that time, we had such good discussions on that subcommittee of the Planning Commission in more intimate rooms with neighbors, with developers, with landscape folks, with awesome architects who've worked in this town for 40 or 50 years. And so I want to respond to Julie and other concerns, and, uh, and, and, and as me and Samantha talked about this a bit. I wanted to ask the applicant how they would feel about, uh, it's not design review, we don't have that. I don't even know that we want that, I feel you. I was in Sunnyvale today where they do have design review, standing next to one of those big old mock-ups, you know, and mm -hmm. like that costs money, but I feel like for the public, that's such a more accessible <laughs> thing to kind of see and be like, oh, that's what we're getting, than the very well described material palette you have in the plans. So, um, S Samantha, I think it's okay to just request that staff work on this idea moving forward. And then uh, maybe me and Lee can talk a bit more about how that should be configured and then council could make the final decision. Does that sound, um, we talked like at the last minute, so I just wanted to circle back and see. Uh, yeah. Um, we could, you could do it that way, um, or we could include a condition of approval. Um, I, I think that you're referring to a subcommittee that would review design modifications that are proposed to this particular project, um, mm -hmm. part of building permit issuance. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. 
And, yeah. and I really want to say again that this is not because we don't trust the developer. Uh, I'm thinking of 555. I don't know. I don't remember you being there a lot. The other Jesse was around back then. Uh, that's a great project. It's delightful. We thought we weren't going to get the affordable units because we had a requirement of zero at that time. And through the conversion, we ended up getting them. So thank you for that. I forget that is that you or the next person, but uh, thank you. Uh, let me get back to the point. Uh, it was very valuable to have a subcommittee to assist staff. And we're, we were called in several times. We had several really good architects on, on the commission at that time. And it was really nice, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm interested. I don't want to hold up your project. I never want this project to have to come back to us because a shingle changed or that steel changed color. But I'm accountable to the public here, and people want buildings of quality, continued quality, you know, that you guys have done this before. So I just wanted to pitch that out there and uh, think about doing that on this project. Let me, I'm kind of rambling on, but ad hoc committees, as I understand them, can be established by the chair, and then it's up to the planning director if staff is participating. So, you know, that's a pretty good balance of power, and, you know, I think it would be good. The last thing I want to say is I was thinking about the earthquake in 1989 when I was here. I was 13. I was six, you know, when Miss Edie Miller moved in, so I'm not quite that young. Um, my dad was on the city council at that time, and, like, our downtown was gone, right? And everyone's like, oh, what are we going to do? So we established Vision Santa Cruz, which I don't know if Cindy would remember, but that was like the most amazing thing. Left and right worked together, the developer, I mean, because we had to, we had nothing there. So the intent of this subcommittee would be to contribute to the most beautiful river walk we could possibly have under budget and within constraints. And um, I want to push for it, and I think we should do it. And I, I, I'm pretty sure we can work out the details. I don't know if staff wants to respond more. And I'd like to hear from the applicant if you hate this idea or, or what you think. Um, yeah, thank you. So th we, we did pull um, a condition that you had proposed um, on a prior project, mm -hmm. and we made some modifications to it, but I do have the language here um, if you wanted to review that. Yeah. Um, on the last project where this came up, there there is some language in here that I think caused some concern that we should probably um, talk about. It was just a section that said, such subcommittee will coordinate with the applicant and the director of planning and community development to achieve the highest possible quality of streetscape and finish. Um, that is a bit vague. And so um, it, when you're ready, I can pull this up. And if you wanted to move forward with a condition of approval, if you wanted to move forward with just directing staff to um, you know, figure out what that condition would be prior to the city council meeting, we can do that as well. Let's see it. And, and please let, give me feedback, too. Was Jesse going to say something? Yeah, come on up. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Just no because problem. I don't primarily work in construction, I would want to consult with our construction team because sure. they would be a part of that. So um, if there is a recommendation for staff to uh, work on something that, that might be applied as a condition um, to where we could all collaborate to make sure it's, it's appropriate because... I'm not the one to make that decision. Understood, and I don't want to spring it on you. You know, I don't want your project to pay for all this, uh, according to <laughs> but, uh. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. I think this condition, the way it's, it's currently worded, um, is really um, meant to address changes that are made by the applicant and evaluating those changes you know, by a subcommittee with the ability to potentially um, refer it to the full planning commission and or make use of our existing, um, we have an a architect on retainer that we use to yeah. answer some of the questions that Commissioner Conway has, mm -hmm. has brought up. We can and do use him okay. um, quite often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first part of this condition is um, a standard condition, uh, the italic portion, and um, it's been uh, modified to refer to this subcommittee, I believe, must be submitted for review and approval by the planning director of planning and community development prior to submittal of the building permit. And then the second part is the language that was added um, regarding the subcommittee. I'm just reading it just a sec.
Commissioner Masita Miller. Thank you, Chair Kennedy. As I recall, um, this was a proposal that was uh, withdrawn. Uh, unless my memory is at the last meeting, at the last meeting, I believe you made this proposal and it was withdrawn after discussion by the commission. That's correct. The language has been modified, but it's the yeah. same intent. And I, yeah. I think that the difference is, um, I know I, I spoke against that last time because um, I didn't want an approval to be considered discretionary, which is um, particularly vital if you have a tax credit um, application because. Um, it'll make you ineligible for funding. Um, so I think there is there a way to craft um, some feedback and early enough in the process. I mean, maybe this is this is intended to sort of watch over it as it goes along and be a sounding board, if you will. But I do think that that issue of not having it be in any way um, muddling um, the approval that that was the important point. And I think this might might not do that. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'd be. Um, if I could just weigh in one more time, um, we did have some comments. Um, I think I heard some comments regarding the materials that are proposed on the building currently. So, if you were interested in modifying those materials that are proposed, you would need to do that as a condition of approval because this would only. Um, address changes to what you're approving or what the city council is approving. Right, that was what I was gonna actually ask is, I mean, I did have some specific questions about the materials because they're pretty vague in that, particularly when it says, you know, cement horizontal board, like it doesn't actually say what the brand is or, you know, and I, know, I happen to know that there's a big difference between those and so, again, I want to reiterate, I'm not trying to hold things up, but in terms of a process, this situation only addresses if you were to decide that you wanted to use metal instead of wood or completely change things. But earlier in the process or having some standards where we actually know what that is so that we know what we're changing you know, is, is kind of a critical thing in, in a project of this scale, I feel like. And so this does address after the fact, but I wonder, um, is there something that can be done earlier in this process as a tool for you as a developer? I mean, you have your architect, there's obviously somebody on retainer, but, but we're here as volunteers to be a resource on a multitude of levels. And so um, I'd be interested in, in figuring out what the opportunity is to help staff, because you're limited in your bandwidth too on how to make these projects truly the best that they can be and the more people. Um, one, one option would be, we used to regularly collect materials boards um, from the, for these large projects mm -hmm. um, and that went away with COVID and digital and you know everything is digital now. Um, but it's still on our application form. I believe we could, um, uh, direct staff to be more diligent about collecting those materials boards, especially when they're coming before you, so that you can see an actual sample of the materials. I mean, I still want to address the timeline on this because what I'm finding, I know I'm a newbie on this, but I'm like, I've got a, a full-time job in a week to process a thousand pages and wrap my head around all the different aspects and I, you know, appreciate everybody, you know, that's 30,000 feet and I'm down here at 5,000 feet talking about trash enclosures, but it requires all of that and all of us to be able to do that for the public. And so um, even the material board, I guess I would just be curious, you know, is that, I mean, it would help the developers earlier on in the process, you know, the sooner we get that information and can, provide feedback so that we're not at the, the podium having this discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering and just kind of floating this to my fellow commissioners if maybe it makes sense to deal with the substantive issue here with the motion on the floor and then maybe after we're done, uh, direct staff or make a motion to direct staff to bring back some language on materials review at some point in the process that doesn't necessarily hold up, uh, you know, tax credit applications and securing of funding, but also gives us an idea 
of what types of materials are actually going to be used. Because I know for myself, somebody who's currently going through a remodel, seeing the materials is really different than seeing it in a catalog or seeing it online. So maybe there's a way after we deal with the motion on the floor and um, this project to, to do something with that intent. I love that idea. Let's split it out. Further, I'm comfortable just like directing staff to do that and, and come back to us or council. I don't want to word workshop this right now. And um, does that work for everybody? Okay. Yeah, it, so it's been a while since I've um, <laughs> looked at the actual application form, but I'm pretty sure Sam's right in that it does include um, that an application be submitted with the materials board. And, and um, you don't need to direct us. We can, we're happy to uh, highlight and send it out to you by email what, what that looks like. And, and I think she's right. We need to get back on track um, with, with um, getting something to you for these meetings. Okay. Mm -hmm. That totally works for me if everyone is good with it. Uh, we hear, hear a lot, like, we don't want to look like L.A., we don't want to look like San Jose, so, you know, maybe we can keep Santa Cruz weird with some cost-effective tiny comments on, on particularly the river levee part, you know, which is the public space. Um, okay, let me say again that these guys are, you know, filling in the levee to make new land in Santa Cruz, building a park there and basically giving it to us, right? So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I just I just want to convey, um, you know, our material board is it's we, we, it's not our intent for it to be vague, but it's really about um, product availability. Absolutely. And, you know, so you can't really say that certain brand. A lot of us, uh, at least in the construction industry or even the design industry, um, supply was challenging for the past two years. So, you know, you may have one material one day and then a month later and they're not making it anymore. Um, so, so I think we do appreciate a little bit of flexibility. Again, we understand the intent. We want to build something great, and we feel we build. Um, we built a lot of buildings downtown, and we we like what we build, and we hope you do too. So, um, yeah, we're willing to figure that out. Thank you, and, and you know, we can't impose a subjective standard on you anyway, right? right. So this is not about I want it to be pink and Bob right. wants it to be blue is really an honest attempt to help things out and, and make awesome urban spaces. Thanks for, I appreciate uh, it. for Thank accommodating you. that. We're all clear. Um, two more quick things. We talked about the arts question. I think we're fine, just let that sit. It's a big thing, but I'd like to direct staff to find a funding source for art in this town. Uh, Tim Marie and I were talking about, what is it, San Jose does 1%? Is that in relation to this project? Yes. <laughs> OK. Making sure, because mm -hmm. you guys got a little sly on me at the last That's meeting. true, that's true. That's I want to make sure when you guys really go to vote on this that you know what it is before you vote on it. Absolutely. That's not a condition or anything. That's just me saying that. <laughs> Lee. <laughs> Hello, commissioners. I'd again, like to chair. respond to the things that we've um, been saying. I'm fairly certain that we already have a 1% for the arts. Oh, cool. um, I just... Um, was looking back at our public works director, and he said, I think that oh, okay. we also have it. And so uh, <laughs> between the two of us, I was confident enough to get up here and say, yes, and I'm pretty sure that we have a 1% um, for the arts. Um, and um, if it pleases the commission, I'm, I'm happy to provide um, some of the back of the envelope specifics um, that uh, Commissioner Dawson was speaking to with respect to the affordability of units and the prices. Um, that sounds good. Um, thank you. Maybe it should be 3% for the arts, but we'll leave it there. Um, uh, yeah, I'd so, love to, to hear all your Sure. Responses. So so just quickly, um, the project has 28 of the 37 required inclusionary units at 50% of area median income. Um, that's the very low income level. So <clears throat> roughly, you know, you can say a family of four is around um, 100,000 or family of three. I, I can't remember exactly, but... I use the 100,000 because that's an easy round number to, to do math from. Um, and um, the way our ordinance is structured is um, the um, annual income is, uh, or the monthly income technically, it's 30%. For very low income, you can only spend 30% of your income uh, on your rent. So um, for those units, um, if it's a $50,000 annual, 50% of the area median income, $50,000 annual, that works to about um, $1,250 per month for the rent for very low income. For um, the uh, other 
So that's, that's for 28 of the units. Nine of the units are at 80% of the area median income. And um, so that would be roughly $80,000 uh, a month for that family of three or four. And um, then um, that particular um, income category, I'm just going to confirm here. And uh, if anyone wants to reference it, it's uh, section 24.16.015.2. Um, that's the affordable rent and um, the payment standard, uh, let's see, for um, low-income households, it uses 35% of the income instead of 30. And so there is a distinction in some of those income levels, but it's, it's based on um, the area median income and then the, um, uh, the either 30 or 35% of your income level. So that's what... Uh, rents are based on based on uh, our inclusionary ordinance. Thank you for having the, the real numbers there. That's really helpful. You're welcome. All right, so I have uh, one more quick one for the applicant, and then uh, we're done, if you wouldn't mind coming up. Uh, this project was passed when we had a 12% requirement for level two EV chargers. Mm -hmm. And I noticed you had puzzle stackers, which is awesome. I feel you on the transformer room. Mm -hmm. Would it kill you to do 20% EV level two installed? And it's pretty objective, but you know, pull me back if, if, if that's trying, too I think we have, because some, uh, I think we can accommodate that. I'm trying to look at the total. So we're 12%, we have 22, so you're looking at like 44. 56, I just did super fast math in my head. 40, something like that. Making sure. <laughs> um, I think we can accommodate that. Okay, yeah, I'd like so. to have that condition, and then of course, if you find it to be extremely onerous, you're going to council anyway. So sure. Um, talk to them about that. Yeah, the stacker. There, there's an electrical converter you can add. Yeah. And even if we have applicants that, let's say, they decide to convert from a gas to a fully electric car, we could add that. The parking's unbundled, so it would be, you know, catering to that specific person. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we could do that. My concern is just that uh, apartment dwellers can charge overnight. So um, I'd like to propose that condition of approval. So since you have a motion on the floor, you would ask for that friendly amendment. It, Good point. Yeah, Thanks. and also state what it is, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I have them, um, them drafted here. To us. Um, so the, I think the conditions yeah. that that we've heard are this is the um, this is the one regarding the murals that I was speaking of earlier, and I'm sorry if that's not written very clearly. Um, obviously, this would be modified because this talks about the north and south ends of the development. Yeah, that's clear. Um, and then the subcommittee um, condition is here. Um, I just struck this, and I think it still has the same, um, it, it provides the same direction without it. So it establishes a subcommittee to review modifications to the design. Okay. Um, and then your... Um, EV parking, 20%. Thank you. Um, this is the balconies condition. I think I didn't do a very good job because I kept thinking, should I include surfboards and wetsuits? <laughs> 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 Mountain bike, I mean, where do we start? I would say no, but if you go to 555 Pacific, there's one right there that's got about four or five stocked up. <laughs> so <laughs> maybe there's one surfboard. <laughs> so, uh, all joking aside, they do these amenity areas now that are cool for your longboard and your e-bike and stuff, so that's cool. Um, so should it please the maker of the motion, I would like to propose all four of these conditions of approval be added to the project. Yeah, and I can take these on as a friendly amendment, correct? Yeah. Like all four of these? And how about the friendly amendment? Yeah. Then yes. Good. Yes. Thank you. Last thing, Julie had an idea about splitting out the height. Do you want to talk about that more? Or um, it's not the time. It's up to you. You know, I, th I think I made my point <laughs> um, maybe more than once. Um, I do think that the um, going into these projects with the assumption that the bonus height is granted um, and then calculating the density bonus, I think that is a disservice. and. Um, I would ask that that be um, not assumed. 
Um, I'm not against it being proposed. I think on this particular project, I would have pushed pretty hard because I think it could have been, I mean, what do I know? Um, I've certainly looked at the spreadsheets enough, but I think it could have been financially feasible without it. Um, at this point in time, I think it, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and support this project, but um, I would ask that it not be assumed and it really be considered so that we can really weigh out what is the benefit that we're getting um, for these tall buildings, because I, I think the community needs to know. All right. Chair Kennedy, could yep. I ask for a, just a clarification? Sure. Um, so, so the intent of bringing them together was really just to eliminate a step in the process, but I hear your concern. Um, would it be helpful if these were to come together in the future to have a, a the base plan set separated so you could actually see the different yep. plans. Okay, yeah, so they could sure. come together to you again, meeting. but provide those. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Director? Hi, thanks. I, I found the public art um, uh, provision, <laughs> and I wanted to clarify. Searching skills are amazing. <laughs> I wanted to clarify. It says uh, in 12.80.030 of the Municipal Code, annual appropriations for public art shall be calculated by fund as 1% of an average of the most recent three-year total eligible capital spending. So I wanted to be clear because uh, I wasn't sure if I had articulated that as an impact fee, uh, which it is not, which is separate from what we have as 1% for the arts yeah, in terms of spending there. set forth on um, capital, eligible capital spending. That's a good clarification. Thank you. All right. I'm, uh, one more quick comment. These buildings are amazing. They're all electric. Like if you built one today, you're about 60% clean renewable energy. The state's goal as 2030, which is coming up for 100% clean renewable electricity. So I just wanna salute that, that that costs a lot of money. This is a really hard code. I feel the pain on your electrical rooms and uh, welcome to the future. But these are amazing apartments, cutting edge, top of the line. So thank you for providing them. And uh, let's have a roll call vote. <coughs> Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Abstain. Again, abstain. No. Uh, Gordon? Aye. Mac, uh, Masidi Miller? Aye. Wolhemius? Aye. Chair Kennedy? Aye. So that ends the second uh, item. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Uh, I do have one information item. I know everybody's ready to go home, but. Uh, I couldn't miss the opportunity. Tess, would you mind distributing that to the uh, commissioners? So I decided as chair to just kind of uh, document this year the numbers of housing that we're documenting, I mean that we're approving here. It's just for fun. I'm gonna distribute this at each meeting that we have. When I hear we gotta build 3,800 units in seven years, that's pretty intimidating but I want to salute staff and everybody for bringing us this many units. This is out of date already, but I'm going to keep bringing this up so we can keep track of how many units we're producing for our town. Um, that's all. Any other informational items? Just a you run through schedule? quick update on the schedule, yeah. Um, so for the next meeting on the 16th, we just have that one item that was continued that uh, involves amendments to the parking and bike parking ordinances. Um, Tess sent an email to you all today or yesterday um, regarding a potential special meeting on the 30th um, to, to um, review the Coral Street visioning efforts. And some of you have replied. Um, can we get replies from the others that haven't yeah. replied? On whether you're available? Are people available on the 30th? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm not I, calling I anybody out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It, was, it was kind of late-breaking, if I remember right. <laughs> yeah, I didn't respond. I, I would be... Did I get a two-thirds vote, please? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a couple of people that responded right away, and we know who you are. <laughs> I'm a teacher's pet candidate also. Yes. <laughs> um, I am not, but I am available the 30th. <laughs> I'm an actual teacher, and I'm available, so... <laughs> 
Oh, it gets better. And I'm, I'm available also, Taz. Okay. Now, Eric, uh, should we, I, I mean, we're going to come in the 16th just for that informational presentation. Should we just? Well, you're, um, out to the, you, you'll be uh, making a recommendation to city council. Okay. Okay. On, on the 16th, Good. on the ordinance amendments. Okay. We have a quorum then on the on the thirtieth. Oh yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so we're good for the thirtieth. <laughs> um, and then uh, out looking out to April, um, we're we're potentially looking at April six as a, a date to do a check in on the housing element efforts to date. So that's still a little bit in flux, but we're we're targeting that. It's uh, during spring break, so I'm not available that day. Did you say you're not available? All right, and that's all I had. Great, thanks again, staff. I appreciate all your work. Um, we don't have any items referred to the future agenda, so with that, I will adjourn this in-person meeting. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Kennedy. Nice you're welcome. way to run the meeting. I have one suggestion. Um, can we make this a digital uh, handout rather than a paper handout in the future? Oh, just an information item. Yeah, thank I you. This is our first imprint from, you know, bringing some papers, bringing it on. Doing something. We'll save a, you know, we'll save a tree. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy.